work session of the Board of Education of for June 2nd, 2020 is called to order for Portland Public Schools Board of Education. This meeting is being audio streamed live on channel 28 and will be replayed throughout the next two weeks. Please check the district website for replay times. This meeting is also being audio streamed live on our PPS TV services website. Tonight, in addition to reviewing the timeline for bond referral and a financial overview, we will have an opportunity for discussion as we consider options for the 2020 bond renewal. Um, hello, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Um, good evening. Can't see all your faces yet. Um, I want to take just a minute. It's so hard for us to connect with one another and also for us to process through really complex topics like this bond consideration before us with so many materials to prepare. It's so hard to do in Zoom. Um, but I want to take a minute even in this um, strained, strained means of communication to recognize just what an incredibly painful week this has been for our nation, our students, our families, and for all of us who have committed ourselves to addressing the historic inequities and systemic racism that is embedded in institutions like this school system and certainly including this school system. And I think that is what has called many of us to our work. And I wanna thank the superintendent are you here, Superintendent Guerrero? I haven't seen you yet on Zoom. I wanna thank the superintendent for his message to our families this week and our community affirming our commitment to our black students and saying unequivocally that we cannot stay silent and we cannot stay neutral about racism. And thank you, Superintendent, for for that communication in this in this moment. And I'm proud to be part of this explicitly anti-racist organization and to stand by the strategic priorities that center our decision making on our black students and all of our students of color. And we just affirmed that in the last time we were together in looking at our um our, our strategies around developing the budget and facing some diff difficult choices with the budget. Um, but um, I want to acknowledge that I'm proud that those are the those are the the priorities and this and the values that this organization is committing ourselves to um, in order to serve serve our black students. So thank you, thank you, everybody. Um, and thank you to all of our student activists, some of whom in my own house who are having a hard time figuring out what to do in this moment and how to make change. Um, we support you and we look to your leadership to all of our students. Thank you. Um, I want to proceed. This is a work session, which really just means that we're focused on one topic, which is consideration of options for the 2020 bond. Um, we will have a bit of public comment here at the beginning of the work session. Ms. Bradshaw, as I understand it, we have two people signed up for public comment. Um, yes, yeah, so we only have one that has called in. Um, okay. I'm good. Have so are we ready? Sorry. Um, I'm going to quickly review our guidelines for public comment, um, and then hopefully our, our second person who signed up will join us. Um, please, please make sure to state, state your name with the beginning of your public comment offered uh, virtually to us uh, and spell your last name for us. You'll have two minutes to speak. Um, you'll hear a sound after the first two minutes, which means it's time to conclude your comments. Um, we really appreciate you showing up here with us tonight and sharing your thoughts. Ms. Bradshaw, who is our first person signed up for public testimony? I have just unmuted you. Good evening, Commissioner Thank Jayapal. You. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Khan, Sam, um, board members, and Superintendent Guerrero. Thank you so much for giving me this chance to speak to you. 
Uh, I am Kishida Jayapal, that's J-A-Y-A-P-A-L, Multnomah County Commissioner for District 2, representing North and Northeast Portland. Can you hear me? I've got a bunch of static on the line, so I want to make sure you can, can. hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, I think, great. I think not everybody's um, and, and I want to say that I, I okay, um, I, I, I thought I had three minutes, and so, you know, you'll, I hope you'll give me a little forbearance, but otherwise you could just cut me off mid-sentence. Mid um, I'm here because I understand that you're considering your options for a 2020 bond referral, including whether the referral will, in, will include the rebuilding of Jefferson High School. And I'm here to urge you to move forward with the rebuilding of Jefferson. We all know the history of Jefferson and the neighborhood it serves. We know that North Portland is a historic and present home of Portland's black communities. We know that our black communities have experienced displacement, educational inequities, health inequities, economic inequities, all rooted in and caused by intentional, structural, and systemic racism. We also know that despite all of that, our black communities have been resilient. They've maintained their relationship in and with North Portland and in and with Jefferson High School. In this moment, in this moment during a pandemic, that has disproportionately taken the lives and livelihoods of black and brown people. In this moment, the week after the murder of George Floyd and after the nationwide and local convulsion of grief and rage, that's a response not just to Mr. Floyd's death, but to all the profound injustice that led to his death and to the loss of countless black lives. In this moment, we all pledge to do things differently. You and we have an opportunity here to do that, to do things differently. A rebuilt Jefferson would be a concrete, literally and figuratively concrete investment in our black communities. It would reinforce an anchor and it would help create the conditions for moving the needle on the stubborn in educational inequities experienced by black students in the Portland public school system. Rebuilding Jefferson has always been the right thing to do. And it is even more so the right thing to do in this moment. I want to close uh, not with my words, which always feel inadequate to this motion, to this moment, but with some words from Eve Ewing, the author of a book called Ghosts in the Schoolyard. The book is about school closings on Chicago's east side. So the subject isn't directly applicable because we're not talking about a closing here, but rather about rebuilding. But the perspective she provides is applicable. She talks about the fight to keep schools open, about how in fighting for their schools, community members are fighting for an acknowledgement of past harms, a reckoning of present injustice, and an acceptance of the reality of the value of their schools in communities. And towards the end, she says this, quote, we must continually set our sights on what it would look like to get things right. And we must integrate those visions into our rhetoric and our strategies. A rebuilt Jefferson would be part of what it would look like to get things right. It would represent that acknowledgement of past harms, the reckoning of present injustice, and an acceptance of the reality of the value of Jefferson to this community. It would be one way, just one way, but an important one, to match our strategy to our rhetoric. Thank you. Commissioner Jayapal, thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, Ms. Bradshaw, has our other person uh, chimed in? No, I just got a message in email from her saying that she was having trouble getting in. Um, I think, why don't we um, proceed? Why don't we proceed with our conversation? And if you learn from her that um, she would like to testify and that she's connected to us, then we can, um, we'll interrupt ourselves and invite her to do so. How does that sound? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to uh, ask Director Scott, the chair of our board school improvement bond committee to um, walk us through a bit of a timeline around this decision making. 
process for uh, building building and options for a 2020 bond package. Just like everything else in our in our lives and in our world, uh, this process can be divided into pre-COVID and post-COVID. And um, that has led to some different ways of thinking about what we want to do. And that's the conversation that we're going to continue tonight. So, um, Director Scott, would you like to just remind us where we've been and what brought us to this moment? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Constam. Um, so, yeah, and I'll just give, I'll spend a few minutes sort of recapping what got us here, and then we can turn it over to staff for some presentation and, and then board conversation. Um, what we're doing tonight is is continuing to uh, the discussion, right, of a potential 2020 bond package. And, and and I do think it's important to just sort of remind everybody of how we got to, to where we are in, in the conversation um, tonight and, and where we're going to go um, from here. Uh, I think one of the things that's important to remember is that Portland Public Schools has had a long-term vision for addressing its infrastructure backlog. And, and I think that vision doesn't get um, as much attention um, as sometimes I think it, it, it should. Um, but voters have really strongly supported that vision. And, you know, voters passed a modernization bond in 2012. They passed another modernization bond in 2017, um, which combined funded um, uh, the modernization of six of Portland high schools, along with important health, safety, and seismic improvements throughout the district. The overall infrastructure need within the district is, is massive, um, and that shouldn't surprise anybody. There were really decades of underinvestment. Um, that's not just a school district problem, though. That's a, that's a societal problem. Um, it's going to take a long time to fix all that infrastructure issues that the district is facing. But I really do want to um, focus on the fact and acknowledge the fact that PPS is, is actually a leader in this area. Um, I've spent the last 20 years or so doing public budgeting and operations, and I can tell you um, flatly that most governments don't have a plan in place to address their infrastructure needs, much less a financing mechanism like the school district has. Um, the city of Portland doesn't have such a plan. Multnomah County doesn't have a plan. State of Oregon doesn't. Certainly the federal government, um, no matter how many infrastructure weeks we have, um, does not have a plan for sort of addressing this backlog. But Portland Public Schools is on a path that um, over the next um, 20 to 30 years will address a huge portion of, of the need. Um, but what we need, obviously, is continued voter support for that. Um, and that's why we're talking about a 2020 bond um, to continue this work and really to continue to make these investments that I think people, parents, community members, businesses are beginning to see um, the impact of these investments. When you visit some of, of, of our rebuilt high schools, um, they're, they're, they're truly amazing. And they're the type of thing that I think um, this community wants our students to have uh, as they go forward in their education. So as a result, we started this conversation last year um, and we started it in the, in the bond um, committee. Um, we had meetings uh, October 8th, um, November 7th, uh, November 21st, December 4th, and December 19th. And all those meetings, in addition to focused on, on current management of the 2012 and 2017 bonds, um, also began to sort of approach what, what would the next bond, what should the next bond look like? What should it include? On January 7th of this year, the board passed a resolution that directed staff to develop a general obligation bond for the November 2020 election. Um, we continued after that resolution was passed to have committee conversations um, in, on January 16th and February 13th. We had another full board work session on February 18th. We had additional committee meetings on March 12th and, and May 7th. And then finally a full board work session this, this, this last week on May 19th. The goal all along has been to develop a package that continues the modernization program and prioritizes our most urgent district needs. And then in the middle of these conversations of which, as you can tell, we've had a lot of, we also had a pandemic. Um, and, and I think it's important to acknowledge um, the impact that's had on the conversations and really the impact that that, that might have going forward as, as we think about what the most urgent needs in this district are. Before COVID-19 entered the community, um, we were considering uh, as a board and as a district, um, an eight year, $1.4 billion bond. This is an amount that would allow us to finish Benson High School. It would also allow us to invest in health, safety, modernization projects. Um, and even at this amount, which would be a very large dollar amount, we would only be asking voters to renew the current tax rate and not increase it. And that's been a goal. Taxpayers currently pay $2.50 per thousand um, through property tax levy. And, and, and the goal of the district moving forward is just to really maintain that rate. And we can do all of this modernization and rebuilding and infrastructure, um, address our infrastructure and assets by just maintaining that tax rate. However, as a result of, of the COVID-19 crisis, um, it's caused us to really rethink what the best way is to move forward. 
And one of the things the crisis has done, and we've heard this from the superintendent and his staff over the last couple of board meetings, is, is underscored the crit critical nature of our school facilities. Um, this includes access to technology, um, both access to devices as well as internet connectivity, and the realization that it's it's never been more important to have that access to access to technology um, as we adjust to distance learning as a way to adapt um, um, during the pandemic. Um, we've also um, been focused on curriculum needs and those needs to meet current standards, support options for engaging students in the classroom, both in the classroom and at a distance. And then also really highlighting what are the critical health and safety needs. The 2017 bond addressed a number of these, but there continue to be health and safety needs across the district, including roofs and mechanical systems that need repairs, replacements, seismic retrofits, ADA improvements and security upgrades. And then at the same time, there's a desire, and, and, and I think it's in, essential that we continue the long-range plan to modernize and rebuild Portland schools. So the key question that we're going to be addressing tonight um, is, is really this. How do we balance these short-term urgent needs against the longer-term school modernizations and continue down this path that former boards and former voters um, have put us on? And I think the second key question for tonight in addition to how do we balance, but but how can we effectively and authentically engage the community during the COVID-19 crisis? And I really appreciate that we had some, some um, public input tonight. And one of the things you'll hear about is our timeline for public engagement moving forward. It's become a huge challenge for every government. Um, as Commissioner Jaipal knows at the, at the, at the county, uh, as I've experienced at Metro, how we engage the community during this time is really, really challenging, but even more essential that we do it and we do it in a really authentic way. So, Post COVID-19, as we're dealing with this pandemic and the out, outfall from it, our conversation is really focused on a different approach. And it's focused on um, potentially instead of an eight year $1.4 billion package, but renewing the current bond rate for a shorter period of time and focusing on some of these urgent projects. And the idea was to focus on critical investments in technology and curriculum, and then potentially return to a bigger conversation about long-term modernizations in 2022. Um, the shift also gives us time, and this is, again, the shift we've been discussing at the last couple of meetings, would give us time to focus on reopening and, and looking towards recovery before resuming some of these community conversations about a longer or larger bond renewal that continues the 30-year plan to fully modernize our schools. Um, and by funding some of these urgent educational health and safety needs across the district, we free up capacity in 2022 for a more, for, um, in, a, in a 2022 bond for more long-term modernization projects. So that's really where we are. And, and tonight we're gonna to continue that conversation. Um, based on previous conversations that I've mentioned, staff have developed options for us to take back out to the community. Um, and so uh, Chair Constant, maybe I'll turn it back over to you uh, and then we can turn it over to staff to walk through some of those options and some of the financing information and other information that we have uh, in our packets tonight and jump into some of the details. Thank you so much, Director Scott. And um, I just want to say, so so based on the last two conversations that we have had um, about development of the bond package, the last two post-COVID conversations, which would have been the um, uh, May 19th bond work session, which was extensive in the May um, and the May 7th um, meeting as well, the, the direction that the board set was looking at the, a smaller, shorter term bond. And that was, um, that was by far the direction of the board, nearly unanimous director Bailey, uh, advocating for still possibly pushing for a larger bond and including Jefferson, Cleveland and Wilson modernizations, um, I've in I've caved. Oh. I've caved. Nah, oh. so, well, I've, I've listened and changed my perspective, but uh, okay. So just speaking to how how we got here. So the options that we have on the table were staff's response to that direction from the board um, to look at a smaller, shorter term bond. So that's what we'll see several variations on that theme tonight. Um, we also have, and this is not something that we have discussed um, yet, but we see in um, half of those options, we also see money that would put a down payment on the modernizations of Jefferson, Wilson, and Cleveland in the form of investing in the design, the full design process. So taking things all the way up to construction documents. 
Um, and then if next time we came out um, would have those numbers and that greater specificity on those projects, as well as having advanced the schedule by a couple of years. Um, so those options are in there for our consideration. I have also asked staff to bring forward an option which does deviate from the direction that the board has set thus far in our most recent meetings. And this would be going back to a much larger bond, um, not our post COVID pivot that we were contemplating of, um, you know, the neighborhood of five or $600 million, but a much larger bond that would include the full modernization of one of our um, high schools, that being Jefferson High School. So we can um, see in um, Dan Young's presentation tonight, um, I think he has a slide that just roughs out the numbers of what that would look like and invite board discussion about whether or not um, we, we ha can have consensus around pivoting back to closer to a billion dollar four year bond or any any of the other specific options before us or any variations therein. So um, with that, we'll turn it back to our conversation of um, the options that staff have put together. And I think first, um, Deputy Superintendent Hertz is going to walk us through some considerations of um, fi the financing, again, based on the the options that came out of our most recent work sessions. So the smaller five to six hundred million dollar bond. Are you is that sure. is that where you're headed? Chair Constance, can I uh, ask a question first or clarify, yes, clarify of course. something first? The outcome of tonight is for the board to agree on options to uh, share with the public to get uh, their input. Is that correct? Yes. That's so we're correct. Not, we're not aiming for board consensus tonight on a package. We're aiming for consensus or close to it on which packages we want to uh, get public input on, correct? That's correct. Narrowing a range of options for public input. Okay. Chair Constam, I just wanted to let you know that I do have our um, second public comment person on the line whenever you're ready for that. Great. Hang tight for just a moment, please. Deputy Superintendent Hertz and Kara, we would love to hear from her. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Do we have anyone on the line who would like to provide public comment? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we were going to have Deputy Superintendent go first. <laughs> we have... Kelly Siegfried, Kelly, I'm muting you. I'm muting you right now. Hello? There we go. Hello. Welcome, Ms. Siegfried. My name is Heather Siegfried. Yeah, my name is Heather Siegfried, and my last name is spelled S I E G F R I E D. Um, I I've been teaching for Portland Public Schools for uh, 20 years now, and I'm a teacher at Oakley Green Middle School and you know before I started teaching I was at Jefferson High School as a AmeriCorps working with the Dreamer class number one and you know I've witnessed the remarkable resil resiliency of my community but I'm really having a hard time understanding why we're fighting for the inclusion of Jefferson High School on this ballot on the modernization project. You know, uh, Jefferson High School is a school that has served the black community for so many years and it's also historically underserved population. And I believe that our Jefferson students and families and community deserve to have a state-of-the-art facility now where they can grow and learn. And I, I would expect the district would want to make this right for the Jefferson families and community and students. And so I think this is one step in the many steps that need to be taken to address the disparities and remake Jefferson High School. And so that's what I wanted to say and give my uh, feedback to the district today and the importance of actually including Jefferson on the ballot and not waiting uh, longer, even after, you know, post COVID. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your thoughts with us. All right, um, Dep excuse me, Superintendent Guerrero, I'd like to, Hand it to you to please um, introduce the staff 
that will be presenting to us this evening on these issues. Uh, good evening, Chair Constan, uh, and thank you for your opening words. Um, and thank you, uh, Director Scott, for providing for the broader public uh, a synopsis of what's been an evolving conversation uh, to arrive at uh, a smart investment package into safety, security, uh, modern facilities that, that our students very much uh, deserve. Uh, and in many ways, it's a timely conversation uh, because we're we're heavy in our thoughts uh, right now. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Dickens' opening paragraph of the tale of two cities is the best of times, the worst of times. Uh, last Tuesday, staff was presenting uh, emerging priorities of our strategic plan uh, because we believe it's important that we try to align uh, all available resources uh, towards student achievement. And when we think a coherent set of strategies will drive more equitable outcomes, and we wanna be particularly attentive to our black and native students. And, and right now, um, uh, it's very important uh, that our, that our, and I wanna communicate directly that uh, our black students uh, were thinking of you uh, because black lives do matter uh, and we're educators. And um, I can't think of a, a, a better way than to really promote uh, critical thinking uh, at this time. Um, so buildings are another important resource. Uh, I can appreciate uh, Commissioner Jaya Paul uh, and our Ockley teachers uh, testimony tonight about uh, the importance in continuing to invest uh, and prioritize uh, our black communities in particular. So uh, tonight we, we have staff coming back with another evolution of uh, hopefully capturing uh, the board's latest thinking. Uh, hopefully uh, at the end of this work session, uh, we'll have a little more guidance from all of you about the kinds of themes uh, we'll want to engage uh, our public stakeholders about next. And I think from staff tonight, we have our chief operating officer, Dan Young, and Courtney Wessling, who are our leads in this effort, uh, and Courtney is our intergovernmental relations uh, person. And I think Claire wanted to say a word about sort of the financial aspect of this uh, before we jump into some of those details. Yes, thank you, Superintendent Hertz. Hey, everybody, it's Courtney Wessling, uh, Director of Government Relations. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, so Roseanne's gonna kick off the slides and I'm gonna just tee us up and then I'm gonna kick it over to um, to our one of our friends, Amy Ruiz, to walk through the um, our bonds um, timeline and then we'll go over to Claire. So just kind of starting somewhere else, but we'll get there in a few minutes. Um, so really quick, next slide. So just a run through the agenda, we're gonna do a referral timeline overview, talk about what decision points are coming um, how community engagement fits in and some key dates that we wanna make sure are on your radar. Um, then we'll go over to Claire for some conversation about financial um, information, a couple of specific questions that were raised um, in the last few weeks. And then we'll go over to Dan to talk about the options and he'll lay out a, um, a few different options with um, some pretty detailed nuance in the numbers. So we'll walk through that. And then we'll come back to me to talk about the community engagement process a little bit more in depth. And then we'll um, open it up for questions and you know other considerations. And I don't know how you wanna do this, Chair Constam, if you wanna take questions and discuss as we go, that's up to you all. Um, but we'll, we'll, we're ready to, to do it however you, however you want. So I will um, have Amy jump in. Amy Ruiz is on, on contract with us to do some of this communications and community engagement work and she is going to walk through the timeline. Let's just see if we can get through each of the staff presentations and hold our uh, questions for each individual presenter until the end, unless it's a clarifying question. Great. Great, thanks, Roseanne. Next slide, please. So I'll keep this uh, pretty quick, just wanna ground us in where we are in the timeline. This has been evolving uh, you know, related to the pandemic and, and to allow enough time to get to where we are today. but. Here's how much time we have left, because we do have a hard deadline to file some paperwork with the county uh, for a referral by August 14th. So we're currently in that first week here of June uh, in, the, in the phase where the board is identifying 
the bond options for further community engagement. Uh, we'll have a little bit more detail on all this in the next slide, but a high, at a high level, the next phase will be that community engagement on the options for about three weeks. Uh, then we will bring that community feedback uh, back to the board uh, to meet the first week of July, discuss that feedback. Uh, it may take you know, two, two meetings to discuss and review that feedback and identify a preferred option. And it may be uh, that you end up amending one of the options that you put out to the community based on that feedback. Uh, then we would put that preferred option back out, uh, post it on uh, PPS's website and uh, notice a public hearing on that option. We're currently pegging July 21st as the held date for that public hearing. Uh, then the board would have an opportunity to hear that feedback on that preferred option, direct staff to fine tune it in any way uh, so that the final referral paperwork can be prepared uh, and voted on July 28th, which would then allow that paperwork to be filed the first week of August. That does give us about 11 days of wiggle room. Uh, should the board need a little bit more time around the preferred option or, or after that hearing? But that's the timeline we are trying to stick uh, to right now uh, with that hard deadline of August 14th. Next slide has a little bit more detail. So uh, here we are today, June 2nd, with the board identifying the options for engagement and community feedback. Uh, during that uh, community engagement phase, uh, we will be hosting a community survey. We did this four years ago for the 2017 bond or three years ago for the 2017 bond. A little over 800 people responded to that survey to provide the board. Uh, I think the question, the way we framed it was, what should the board be considering as they decide what to refer to voters? We are also uh, planning to do a representative sample poll uh, to gauge uh, priorities for community members and voters. And the board has, has been engaged uh, for a while now in reaching out to stakeholders uh, you know, within your own districts that you represent and across the broader community. And that we hope will continue and all come together to inform that preferred option. So in early July, the board will review all of that feedback, uh, the results of the survey, the poll, what you're hearing from members of the community uh, and discuss that to identify the preferred option, which we will then post uh, again, public hearing July 21st, uh, targeted referral vote on a final option July 28th so that we can file the notice of ballot title by August 3rd. And the hard deadline for that notice of ballot title is August 14th. This is all towards the November 3rd election. Thank you very much. Is is that, are you finished? That is it. Are there any questions? Okay. We can always and return to this too uh, at the end as a refresher of where we are and what's next. And just to underscore the obvious from the beginning of your presentation, there is very little room for, very little wiggle room on that schedule. <laughs> Working from now to the referral date. Does anyone have any questions on those dates? All right, Ms. Westling, do you wanna move us forward? Yeah, next slide, please, Roseanne. So there were a couple of key questions that came up um, in the past few weeks, and we wanted to address them head on um, and have um, Deputy Superintendent Hertz join us to kind of talk through some of the, what we like to call the subway tiles. Um, you should have gotten that document in your packet. It's the pretty one with lots of bars. Um, so Deputy Superintendent. Good evening, Claire Hertz. And uh, so, and to make this a real short presentation, the answer is yes and yes. However, I'm sure you want just a little bit more detail than that. So what we have in the presentation is, of course, the, the um, lower amount. We have two versions on slide 9 and slide 21, uh, excuse me, in those pages in the packet um, for the financial analysis. You will find on slide... Uh, Page nine, um, 584 million issued in November 20th of 20, and 1.3 billion in 22 or 23. And then on slide 21, we have a larger package up front, 785 million in November 2020, and 1.3 million in 22 or 23. Both of those scenarios are utilizing the same level levy rate. Our rate will remain the same. However, what it does, the more you put up front, the less you have to go to continue working in the future. 
So we want to find the right balance, um, and we can only complete so much work at at one time. So we need to be you know thoughtful about scheduling all the work um, and keeping that level levy rate. So we we will continue to morph and continue to refine our financial um, package to support whatever plan the board brings forward. So as, as I hear new ideas from this evening, we will um, even do, do another analysis for you so that you have that additional insight as to what, what that would mean. So when you guys come down to more of a final scenario or what, what you kind of reach to consensus around, we can run you another analysis and that way you can see how much capacity you're using for the um, short term bond and then how much capacity for the longer next term bond. And then even beyond that, we can show you how it, how it leaves stair steps capacity out into the future. Okay. Questions about that? You will always hear me say we will keep the same rate. We will make the plan around keeping the same rate. Does anyone have any questions about the the significantly more detailed um, material financial information that was included in um, uh, this packet for this work session? Um, Claire, this is this is Andrew. Um, yeah, just a, a quick question, and, and thanks thanks for that um, overall summary. Is there? Um, is there a point, I, the goal again is, as I mentioned and you mentioned, is to keep the rate the same. And so I haven't really formulated this question exactly, but is there a point where um, um, if we were to not go back out in, in 2022 or 2024, that the rate would start to drop that we, you know, and I know you have a lot of flexibility to, to issue some of the bonds earlier um, to do that, but do, do we know, do we know where that line is? So I'm gonna ask you to look at, um... The uh, it's, it says page nine in the PDF, but when you have the PDF page 10, but when it's the hard coded, it says page nine where there's colorful bars. So it's either me. nine, nine or 10. Me. I've got about eight PDFs open. So um, it's analysis PPS GO November 2020 052820. It has analysis PPS. Geo November 2020. Thank you. I'm there. Sorry, I muted myself. No so turn. It's either going to be page nine or page ten, depending on which numbering system you're using. And it um, has uh, gray and black bars, and then um, turquoisey and lavender purple bars. So you on that page? That's what you're looking for. So let's talk through this. Um, you'll see from 2014 to 2020, it's all um, in a darker black color. That's the, our history. And we've been targeting that $2.50 per thousand of assessed value for our rate. So that's the rate that we're um, wanting to keep over time. Are you having trouble hearing me? Are you? Okay, you're doing okay. Okay, I saw someone cupped your ear, so I was just checking. Okay, and then um, then you go into the next year, and you can see um, the lighter gray. That that is bonds that we um, have already issued. So that's um, so we've created stair steps. If you're looking just at the gray, you can see from our 2017 and our 2012 bonds, we have some to pay off over time. So those have already been issued in, and they're purposely have been issued in increments to create those um, four year stair steps. Now we ha are now talking about, if you look at the blue colors of issuing, this is an example of 584 million. So we go out for a, an election in 2020 um, and then we have, we actually break that into two different sales, right? So that's where we get more flexibility about timing is when we, um, we don't issue all the bonds at once because we, we um, can only spend so much at once and it doesn't make sense to um, necessarily um, pay interest on something that you're not using yet, right? You'd want to hold off 
until later. So with that blue, you'd see there's a $300 million issue that we would issue in 2020, right? And then you can see how that continues to get stair-stepped. We go for two years later, then we do a four-year, then we do an eight-year. So these, these options can all change, right? We can stair-step this whatever length we want. So if we want to go two years and then eight years, we could do that. If you want to go four years and then eight years, we could do that. So in other words, we have flexibility of um, doing whatever model you guys need for your vision for how we're going to improve our um, facilities throughout the district. So thank you. Yeah. And so I, I think my, my question specifically, let, let's just assume a scenario of a, of a $584 million bond mm -hmm. um, and, and you can show the issuances there. And then I just want to make sure I understand if, if a future board decided not to go out um, in, you know, uh, 2020, um, Sorry, that is a 2022 bond. If decided not to go out in, in 2024 or beyond, you you could you could um, you could pay those. Can you pay those bonds off more quickly to sort of keep that tax rate at the same levy, so, at the same level? What I would do is that 284 million dollars. I would pay it up, pay it all quicker um, to fill in the uh, the stair step, right? Okay. If we okay. were or holding off, then I'd pay it up quicker and not stair step it out. Thank you. Yeah, and I think this is something that's come up in our committee meetings and our board meetings before. And so just, just to clarify, there's quite a bit of flexibility in terms of how you manage. Now, you have to know what our plan is, um, and that's important, right? Um, but to the extent we have a, a plan moving forward, there's quite a bit of flexibility um, to sort of keep that tax rate steady, which, which again, has been one of the, the sort of policy goals that, that the board and the district has had. So the other thing is our 2017 bond, our most recent issue is, um, so as, as rates have dropped, we also get the chance to, to um, reissue. Um, so our older bonds, so there, there is also restructuring your older bonds to get lower interest rates and savings, and then you can restructure your stair steps that way as well. So there's many different ways, and I don't know, I need to go into all, a lot of detail this evening, but there are many ways to, to manage a, a bond program. Thank you. So, uh, Claire, just uh, again, theoretical. Uh, if we did uh, sell bonds earlier, we'd have to use the money earlier. Potentially, there might be capacity issues in us spending that money in terms of how much work we can manage. So, is, is that uh, an, is that an issue or? Not really, because when you go before the voters, you're going to um, say, this is what we're asking for approval of, it's this am amount of money to do these projects. And we have flexibility based on cash flow and when we need the money on when we issue the next set of bonds. So we make that plan more in the background so that we can manage that level levy rate. And Claire, one more technical question, but there are some restrictions um, in terms of what, when you have issued bonds, there are some uh, requirements in terms of how fast you spend that money once it's been issued. Again, we have flexibility when we issue it. What are, what are those rules? So it, we wanna make sure that we're spending, um, I don't remember if it's 75 or 80%, I'll I'd have to look it up versus the three year period of the issuance date. That's why you won't see me issue all of it at once. I'll do it in chunks to ensure that we're spending it within three years, the, the bulk of the bond issue. And it's not the election amount, it's the amount that we've issued that we've financed that has that time limitation. I'm hearing 85%. Great. Any further Thanks. questions for Deputy Superintendent Hertz? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, then we're going to kick it off to uh, to the esteemed Dan Young to talk about the options. Uh, th uh, thank you very much. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, good evening. Um, uh, as uh, Director Bailey noted you have a whole bunch of documents in front of you tonight. Uh, one of those documents is, is called a board reference documents document. And what that is, is it has a bunch of links 
to previous documents that have either been shared at a board work session or at one of the subcommittee meetings. So hopefully that is a useful tool tonight. Uh, I'll walk through these next few slides pretty quickly uh, as the, the data on them has been the same as, as what we've covered in the past. So uh, for our educational improvements, our top priorities uh, have, has, has been consistent uh, technology curriculum in our SPED classrooms. Uh, excuse me, I would reference you to the document, the Ed and Facilities Improvement Summary that was updated on May 19th, and we reviewed uh, a lot, uh, two weeks ago at the, uh, at the meeting. Uh, that has the options um, for the educational improvements, and those remain the same. And so the, the bond options that we'll look at tonight are consistent with the options that are in that document. So next slide, please. Similar comment here, the health and safety improvements for our roof, mechanical and other improvements, uh, that improvement summary document outlines what the different options are for those uh, and is consistent with what we looked at here back on May 19th. And next slide, please. Our modernization and rebuilds, as we look at the different bond package options, you'll note that all of them include funds to complete uh, Benson and the multiple pathways to graduation projects. Some of them will have varying amounts for uh, planning and design of future high schools and also uh, different amounts for capacity or other educational improvement uh, projects. So next slide, please. Hey, Here are, yes. Um, before we move on to this section, it might be worth noting for anybody who wants to see the details because that was a really high level explanation of a whole a lot of a comprehensive body of work that all those documents are available correct on the pps.net website under the meeting materials so if people wanted to click down and get more information on the roofs or the seismic or the security or anything like that that all that information is posted, so correct? Yes, if I uh, followed your uh, question, all the documents are on the website, yes. Yeah, I just wanna make sure that people know that like, because we're moving through this pretty quickly and we've seen this a lot of times, but if people wanna dive into what that means, sure. the, document, the, the backup documents are posted. Yeah, and on that reference document, all those links actually go back to the board website. So that specific board document on the date of that meeting. Okay, uh, moving in to the different options, you'll see you have six options total, um, uh, all in A's and B's. So three uh, primary options with variations of both A and B. Uh, option A here, uh, as noted, all the options includes Benson and the multiple pathways to graduation project. Uh, also aligns generally with the lower end of the options for the educational improvements and the facility improvements. It is substantially similar to the option uh, that we reviewed in detail two weeks ago uh, at the May 19th meeting. Option 2A uh, also includes Benson Multiple Pathways. However, it aligns with the higher end of the option ranges for the educational improvements and the health and safety improvements. Uh, also includes some funds for additional educational improvements. That would be TDD. It would be projects that we would identify during the course of the bond. Similarly, some funds, $10 million for health and safety TBD projects and $10 million for capacity or enrollment uh, projects. As we've talked in the past, uh, there is a likely need for capital improvements for capacity and enrollment. There just isn't any specific capital project identified as of yet. Next slide, please. Uh, 1B is uh, substantially similar to 1A. The only difference is there is $75 million of funds for design and planning of Jefferson, Cleveland, uh, and Wilson High School. So if this option uh, were to go forward, um, planning and design efforts for those three schools would be included in that bond package. Similarly, uh, 2B is the same as 2A, but has those same funds. So there would be funds set aside for planning and design of the three high schools. Next slide, please. 
And so option 3A and 3B is not, uh, the, the details not in your packet, so we are presenting that here tonight. So this is an option that is actually substantially similar to uh, option uh, 1A, uh, but it includes the budget to complete in total uh, Jefferson High School. So that is one modernization project that would be included and would be completed with this effort. It also includes funds to do some planning of Cleveland and Wilson as well. So those projects would begin with this bond effort, uh, uh, but the, they would not have the funds to complete both Wilson and Jefferson, but, but Jeffrey, or excuse me, Wilson and Cleveland, uh, but Jefferson would be included in totality. And 3B is very similar to 3A, but includes the high end of the range for the curriculum options, uh, whereas 3A has just the lower end of the range for those. So it's just a, a $5 million difference between the educational improvements. And Dan, just to be clear, that, that money that you just referred to um, is, would actually take them all the way through design into construction documents, not just an unspecified amount of pre-planning. Is that correct? Uh, there's potential. We need to put some more time into what those numbers are. It certainly would be enough to start significant work. Uh, and most likely would be enough to, to bridge any uh, efforts between now and a future bond, assuming a future bond does not get delayed. Uh, but we would need to look more specifically at exactly uh, how far we think we could get into uh, the design documents. Thank Dan, you. Dan, I have a question um, mm -hmm. about the Jefferson High School number. Um, so I'm just curious, is that the build the, the core for 1700, but not the wing, or what, what is this number based on? Because I know that only very high level preliminary planning have been done and it looks just high on a, what I would expect from a square footage space um, and just as a very uh, rough estimate or comparison to Benson, which had a much bigger footprint, equipment and everything else. I'm just wondering how that could be a comparable number to like Benson. Yeah, that is a great question. And I will reference uh, back to that reference document. Their uh, document number three is high school master plan options summary. So uh, the, the full master plans for all three schools are referenced in there, but they're also there is a, a summary of the options for each one. So Jefferson, for example, had three different options, which uh, two of the options were full 1,700 uh, student capacity, and there was one option for a smaller 1,000 student capacity. Uh, the three, uh, $320 million option is option A, which is the uh, one of the full-size 1,700 uh, capacity projects. Offhand, we have the, our project manager on the line to answer the question. I can't remember the big difference between option A and C, one of them I, has no, I know has more new construction and one of them is more uh, renovation work. Um, but that is the difference. So this is a full 1,700 uh, student option at the $320 million. And, and it is uh, higher uh, budget than the other schools, the, the Cleveland and Wilson, but it is significantly larger. The existing Jefferson High School building is a large building, uh, has a lot of square footage, so it is a bigger project overall. And and this that number is the preferred staff option that came out of the master planning process. That is, is correct. Uh, Dan, uh, as I recall, we talked about the options in a bond committee meeting a couple of months ago, and um, the rebuilding on the current footprint option was about. $50 million more than a rebuild that didn't stick strictly to the footprint. And uh, I've, does, that, uh, does that ring a bell, fellow committee members? Let me, if I may, I believe our senior project manager, Steve Efros, is on the call. And Steve, if you're there, if you could just quickly walk through the difference between the three options. We know one of them is a smaller capacity option, uh, but if you could talk through the difference between the two 1700 capacity options. 
Yes, hi, thank you, Dan. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, yes, actually, so, so really uh, part of it is uh, options A and C uh, do both maintain the 1909 historic uh, North bar as a classroom building. And then everything else is rebuilt south of that as uh, new construction. Uh, the difference between A and C is really just kind of how how it's laid out on the site. Um, unfortunately, the two diagrams should actually be slightly different. They're showing up as the same, but they're just just variations that the conceptual master planning committee presented uh, as you know two preferred options. They're they're fundamentally pretty close in terms of area and uh, you know program space. Um, the other thing I would add in terms of um, the size of the program is that the conceptual master planning committee would support from the steering committee, which included leadership, uh, determined to actually uh, enlarge, in certain cases, the ed spec for certain spaces. So um, it enlarged from the typical 500 seat theater to a thousand seat theater because of the importance of the Jefferson Dance Program. Um, it included four large dance studios, uh, additional support uh, space for the Jefferson Dance uh, Program. And it has a pretty significant amount of space for partner programs, including SEI and uh, Latino Network. So uh, that's some of the discrepancy, I think, or the difference between uh, this high school from a conceptual master planning standpoint and the other two high schools, uh, Cleveland and Wilson, and possibly also kind of talks to the difference between it and Benson in terms of, or, or maybe it's it's sort of more in the size of, of, of that type of school. So Steve, given what you just said, does it have, um, even assuming 1700 students, does it have more square feet for, per student than our ed specs call for and then what guided, um, has guided our other high schools? Uh, yes, I would say just, uh, you know, net or gross, it, it would, I would say, you know, it has, it has the, the necessary or the same amount of classroom spaces. It's just when you look at uh, some of the shared uh, uh, assembly type spaces, that's where you have a larger capacity. And I think partly the, the, the program and, and uh, you know, with input from the principal as well and the community members, the dance program is seen as not just a you know a school program, but it is uh, something that is kind of a community uh, facility as well. So I think that was sort of part of the justification for enlarging that that uh, space beyond the the ed spec requirements. I uh, I actually attended Jefferson, and uh, I didn't graduate from there, but I attended part time and. Those dance studios were amazing at the time. It was a long time ago. And I think that we Jefferson also partnered with uh, Portland Community College um, to to um, have dance companies that came in from New York that would live in Portland for three weeks and teach classes uh, Monday through Thursday at Jefferson, take a day off and then come back on Saturday and do a, um, a community college class. And so um, I love to hear that there's some like additional seating being um, being talked about because that's a, a wonderful community asset um, to have a, a theater that seats that many people. I have a question for Steve. Um, in the ed specs, we have a requirement uh, for all our high schools for a health center and a teen parent center. Is that also included in the square footage? Yes. This is, um, uh, this is Rita. Has there been any evaluation of um, a modernization versus full rebuild in terms of any kind of cost difference? There wasn't as part of this process. Um, so not, not on, on on our behalf, but uh, you know, it's I, I'm not sure if Dan, if, if if this was run separately through RLB or if they've looked at that at all. Uh, we have not looked at that as an option. Uh, here, the question probably comes from: sometimes schools will have an option for new construction, and sometimes they'll have 
uh, just modernization options. And, and sometimes that is cost driven and other times that is uh, really more driven around what is the desire of the school, what's the desire of the district, what's the desire of the community. And, and I think uh, for the Jefferson, uh, not speaking for Steve and others who attended all the meetings, there's a very strong connection to the existing building. And there was a lot of support around uh, maintaining the historic structure uh, and and modernizing that, similar to what we say, have seen at Benson, similar to what we've seen at Grant and some other schools. Okay, thanks. So I, I want to come back to my original question, um, and maybe um, I'll have to follow up with this offline. Uh, but it seemed to me when we were talking about the footprint of Jefferson that, uh, and, and this wasn't the um, extra spaces for dance that was driving this, but it was sticking to that historical footprint was going to raise the cost by about $50 million off of some alternative. And uh, so uh, I guess I'll follow up on that offline. Scott, I vaguely rem I remember something similar. Yeah, okay, thank uh, it, you. It seems like there was a big <laughs> delta between the two. But fifty million is a middle school. Um, so I just just want to throw that out there for consideration as we're thinking about uh, how to go ahead with this. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate that. And if there was a conversation that that uh, I am not recalling uh, offhand, I'm certainly happy to go back and, and look into that. I, I will uh, answer a little bit also with a little bit of process. Uh, the intent of the conceptual master planning uh, process that we went through was to get a general idea of the cost of modernizing or replacing these schools for the, the purpose of budgeting for a future bond. Uh, if we proceed with a bond that has Jefferson High School, the first step will be to actually complete the master plan. The master plan will go to the board. So if it, there very possibly could be other options. We're not saying that these are the only options. These were the efforts that we went through to get an idea of, of, a, of a budget range. Uh, so if there is a desire to do something to look at a new construction option, we certainly can't do that going forward. Dan, can you talk a little bit? This is Andrew. A little bit about the the timing on on that, and and maybe relate it back to the the, the high schools that are already under under construction. Sorry, I turned off my camera for a second. Um, the high schools that are already um, um, under construction, in terms of of mm -hmm. when those decisions generally get made, because because again, I, I heard you say there are some uh, options of looking at other things, but but this 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 three hundred twenty million dollars is based on the work of the DAG and sort of the the staff preferred option coming out of. So how does that how does that work going forward um, for for this high school and others? Uh, it's a great question. So all the when we decide on the bond package, uh, an example, you know, we're we're talking now, you know, we're looking at uh, an option that includes one high school. Uh, a few months ago, we were looking at options that included three high schools, and this option could include design for others as well. So we need to ultimately decide on a sequencing of what those schools. Uh, looks like. So when do we start design? When do we anticipate starting construction and, and completing those projects? Um, generally, uh, we have about a two-year design process. Uh, so the sooner we can get in design, we, we can start that effort of two years. And then construction is two to three years, depending on the size of the school, depending on how complex it is, depending if it's occupied and has, and has to be phased and those sort of things. So I, I, I think what, sh what you're alluding to is if we take more time planning before we come to agreement on a master plan, then uh, that will potentially push back when we can start design and when we can start construction. Uh, I, I think is what you're uh, what you're asking, but we're generally garden variety looking at uh, two years of design and then two to three years of construction. Yeah, and actually, my question is a little more getting at um, what kind of flexibility we have, and 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 you know, I'll I'll just I'll put it on the table. One of my one of my concerns about moving forward with Jefferson. I mean, the, the first question I think that that Director Brim Edwards asked, you know, um, in this conversation is, what is this three hundred twenty million dollars based on? 
right? And and we've we've had some discussion about this, but it's it's been pretty limited. And so one of my questions moving forward is if there is if there's support to move forward with this in the 2020 bond and we include 320 million, um, are we are we sort of, I mean that it feels to me like that number becomes the number, right? And and we have to sort of figure out how to live within that number. And we've seen some of the issues that come up from the 2017 bond around that. But but does it are we limited in terms of what what we can do with that building? Are we essentially saying um, this this design advisory process that we've gone through is the direction we're going to go with Jefferson, or is there flexibility over the next year or two um, to make changes to that? Uh, good question. I would say there is flexibility to make changes. Certainly, we are not done with the master plan. What we would anticipate on any of the projects was that there would be some level of change between the conceptual master plan and the actual master plan. We wouldn't anticipate drastic changes. If there is a desire to go forward with something such as a new construction and that's significantly cheaper than a modernization option, uh, that might be something worth exploring because of the financial component of it. Uh, but outside that, um, I wouldn't anticipate significant deviations between here and there. And Dan, so the can, I, can I follow up on that? Um, this is Rita. Um, so one of my concerns is um, I think at this point, Jefferson has some very robust offerings in some areas um, and, and is very limited in offerings in other areas. So it's got a very, very strong dance program but a relatively small music program, for example. Um, and I guess my question is, has the educational side of the house um, been involved in, at this point in figuring out um, kind of what the future array of um, offerings might be at a rebuilt Jefferson? And if not, um, how quickly can they be engaged? Um, because if they haven't been, um, I might suggest that we would want to build in a pretty significant fudge factor that would allow us to, um, to accommodate any increases in, or any, any changes in the array of offerings without being behind the eight ball. So just, I have, can, I I just to question? can I just add to Rita's question? Wouldn't wouldn't would that be already included in the ed specs? And is that was that the basis for the design groups to start with, and then the arts was added? It's a good question. I just I thought our theory was we use the ed specs as the sort of base. Every high school has X, Y, and Z. Yeah, yeah. Great questions about about pro, about stakeholder engagement and ed specs. So the ed specs uh, uh, and our design guidelines are really our two fundamental guiding documents. So when we start planning a project, figuratively, they're the two documents we take off the shelves and we hand to our design teams and say, okay, start here. This is this is what our uh, the the similar components that should be in all of our schools. Then that those components blend in with what the existing conditions are uh, and what the programs are or are desired to be at the school. So that stakeholder feedback that we get from educators that we learn by going through the DAG process and having these steering committees, you know, informs the design team uh, about the uniqueness of these sites and what are important to, to be maintained. That is ultimately all codified with the master plan. So the master plan, of course, goes to the board with a recommendation, uh, and then that's what codifies these changes. So all of our high schools deviate from our ed specs uh, to some degree or another and in different areas due to programming, site constraints, or whatever they are, or existing facilities, buildings. Um, but the, the master plan approval is really what codifies, yes, these deviations uh, are uh, acceptable and are approved. And as far as the stakeholder engagement with, with the instruction side and with educators, uh, we go through a couple of different processes where we look to reach out directly 
uh, to uh, school level staff, uh, also you know instruction uh, district level staff, and in in with the design advisory group process. And so we actually put together pretty robust engagement plans and how we do that. But since we have Steve Efros here, I'll let him talk to you briefly about how we have engaged educators uh, on the Jefferson project. Yeah, so, um, you know, it was, it's definitely in the case of conceptual master planning, it's it's obviously a compressed process compared to the full comprehensive, but uh, we engaged uh, through the steering committee with all three high school teams, uh, including in this case with Principal Calvert uh, and her instructors and, uh, you know, pretty much uh, hewed to what Dan described, which is we started with the, the ed specs. Um, I think we stayed pretty close. I, I would have to go and look at percentage wise, how close we were to uh, the ed specs overall. Um, but they were basically the foundation of what we developed. And I think like someone was mentioning, the the additional seating and, and dance rooms were above and beyond that. But we're probably pretty close to the other two high schools, to, to Cleveland and Wilson, in terms of uh, ed spec coverage. Dan, can I ask who's um, like where we are in the master planning process and who's been hired to do that um, that planning process and what their um, engagement has looked like beyond just the building staff or education staff. Uh, good, good question. Um, we have we brought in an architect to to manage the conceptual master planning process, and they completed that scope of work. So their that, work. Is, I'm just wondering who it is. Is it Bora or Bora Architects? We had three different ones for three different high schools. Steve helped me with Jefferson. Yes, yeah, so Bora Jefferson. Architects. Thank you. That's correct. It was Bora. Yes. Bora with one O. That's correct. And where where are they in their like in their development? Where are they in terms of their planning? What do they what do they think might be a date they could present something? So the the master planning the conceptual master plans have been completed and those were presented uh, in January and and finalized in January I believe it was. So proceeding forward uh, with Jefferson or or any of the schools. We would then go through a process of bringing a, a design team on board to do the full design uh, and take us through project completion. Okay, I just also want to just put it out there. There, um, in that kind of immediate area, there's a lot of um, affordable housing being developed. Um, you probably know the residential infill project is going to allow um, greater density on lots in that area. There's an effort by uh, City of Portland to do anti-displacement work in North and Northeast Portland. And so while we might not see, well, we've got neighbors that aren't um, sending their kids to Jefferson now, but I think that the density increases and zoning changes are gonna impact the number of people that live in that area. So just to put that on um, on, on, on the radar that, that they're, we're anticipating a, quite a bit, um, a greater population there in and around the Ockley Green um, interstate area in between interstate and MLK and probably like Rosa Parks and uh, Broadway. Thank you, yeah, we, we appreciate that. Uh, and uh, we also know that when we complete modernizations that the attachment rate for those schools seems to definitely go up pretty significantly. Yes, thank you. So I just wanted Director Lowry, I just wanted to share that um, I think Director um, Scott and Director DePass, we all had the opportunity to participate in that conceptual master plan for, I know, uh, the three high schools. I was on the Cleveland one, and I know that we weren't always able to make those because of the times they were. But at Cleveland, the process was the community looked at things they valued in the building and different things that were important. We talked about the historic facade at Cleveland. Um, and then came up with a couple of variations based on the values of the people on the conceptual master plan. You know, do we have the counseling services near the front of the house or in the back of the house? Like what, what fits for our community's needs? Um, and then uh, one of the things that people got super weirdly passionate about was the address, that like they don't want to change the address of Cleveland. Like if we move the entry to another side, that that would mess that up. Um, but that was a community value. And then out of the conceptual master plan, 
there were three options. Uh, my favorite had like a super cool sky bridge in it. Um, and those were presented in kind of sort of cost estimates. And then from there, there would be more design and more community engagement. So that was kind of the process at Cleveland. And I'm not, and I'm assuming that Jefferson, we, we got those kind of um, that in January, right? The sort of different variations that the Jefferson community had talked about, which is what Director Bailey was referring to when he talked about the $50 million difference of being on the footprint or not. Um, Director DePasa, I don't know if you were able to attend any of those conceptual master plan meetings, but um, was did we ever talk about Tubman at Jefferson? And I know there's been conversations, like I was on the charter committee with Kairos about a center for public excellence, and were those included in the, the cost estimate of the 320? Yeah, I haven't been very engaged, um, admittedly, in that process. I did attend one meeting where Bora Architects was there, kind of um, at the stage where they were um, uh, presenting like bubbled ideas about the entire property. And so we didn't get down to the level of, you know, we really want the address to stay the same. <laughs> yeah, that was like, so random, like who, knew? who knew that was a like big trigger for some people in the community? You know, it's, but, it's like, sometimes it is the little thing. So, yeah. So and I know, like, for me, those meetings were already set when I got assigned to that team. So it was really hard to make, make some of those meetings. And so I understand, exactly. you know, especially with you working full time, not being able to yeah. to get it. But I just wondered if you if you'd heard anything from the community at those that was like the address issue. Um, there's been some discussion, not necessarily related to um, the bond or building or not rebuilding or not um, about changing the name or of Jefferson and there was a big community community process, I think about a year ago or maybe a little longer about the name and what that represented and people were very passionate about keeping the name. Um, so one of the things just back back to Rita's question about the programming, um, one thing that student there's been student interest in and need um, is a high tech music production program that also would complement the other arts program there and that's something that um, as they're looking at the design of the, the school that has been something of interest to students and staff. Um, so one, one uh, Michelle, I'm glad you brought up um, enrollment issues um, because there's, there's a pretty wide you know, Jefferson right now is not a neighborhood school in the sense that uh, the others are because it doesn't have its own unique catchment area. It's got dual enrollment uh, areas with three other high schools. Um, the enrollment right now is in the 600s, I believe. Um, and at least current projections show no change in high school enrollment over the next 10 years uh, for the district as a whole. So I uh, would ask staff what kind of, uh, as we look at um, how big to build uh, Jefferson, um, what kind of enrollment analysis was done. And, um, it, it, you know, depending on what kind of housing goes in makes a difference in terms of uh, how many, you know, children slash young youth per unit, kind of kind of thing in terms of apartments. Um, my sense is it it would take a whole lot of housing to have, uh, you know, to to fill up a 1700 Jefferson given current conditions. So I just want to ask what kind of enrollment analysis has been done as we move ahead. May I respond before we hear? I, I actually don't know that that population projection is correct. I, I actually don't believe it. No, based on what I, I think I know about the projected uh, population increase and the housing, just for instance, and off the top of my head, there are 1,000 single fam. I'm sorry, there are 1,000 units being built um, that are affordable to people making um, about 70% of the median income in North and Northeast area. I don't know how many of those are exactly in the um, Jefferson County area because there is, no, there is none. 
um, those are standalone or townhome style homes. There's a thousand of those projected. The residential infill project has created zoning throughout the entire city of Portland that will allow everyone on a standard city lot, but as we know it now, a 50 by 100 lot to build an additional up to 800 square foot um, residential housing unit on their on their lots. And um, there's still like there's still land here. And and so I, I know that we have the um, Portland State Center for Population. I, I don't think that that I don't think the population projection is accurate. I'd like to see the data. And I also just want to share what I'm hearing when I hear you talk about um, Jefferson that way. And I, I am a little touchy about it, even though I didn't graduate from there, but I did attend there for two years. And um, what I'm hearing is a resistance to um, envisioning and building and supporting and elevating a school that has great significance in the Black community. And um, you know, you're you're entitled to share those. Your thoughts are are valuable, and and we need to, especially this, especially today, like this week, take in what we know, what we've seen on the street in the last couple of weeks, um, and take that and learn from it, and 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 do this thing. Like we need to do it. We we've had just since I can recall mostly white boards making decisions about Jefferson High School. And this is the time to do business not as usual to apply that racial equity lens. We're all in it together, right? Everybody talks about equity. Let's actually demonstrate what that looks like. I think that we don't know what it looks like, but let's actually demonstrate that by supporting a full 1700 capacity gorgeous, modernized, historic building in North and Northeast Portland and expect excellence to come out of that building. Like, let's do that. So, uh, um, why, why don't we do that? So, Director Bailey, to answer maybe your question. Uh, Director I think Bailey, did you have a comment that you wanted to make? Um, I think you were pausing. I, I expect excellence out of every one of our buildings and, and have been working to support excellence and build excellence in, in all of our buildings. So uh, when I, I hear what you say, so first, first let me take a step back. So I, um, a year, uh, I appreciate what you say uh, about Jefferson and about what that future can look like and challenging me to support that. Um, so I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll just stop there and uh, listen to your words and take them into, uh, sit with them. And I thank you for that. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Anything I can, um, uh, um, I wanna make sure I caught all the nuance of that. Um, but I, I think it's like, think positive, think supportive, think excellence in, in terms of envisioning a future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Bailey. Yeah, and, and going beyond that, it's like actually being intentional about elevating the experiences of people that are out marching in the street right now because of you know, this generational trauma and 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 when you're when you're on the bad side or the downside of not being given you know the tools and you know and and the the resources that everybody else gets you do feel you do feel beleaguered and so I think this is a defining moment for us as a district and actually you know there's a lot of bad stuff happening out in the world right now but I feel hopeful that this is such a great opportunity for us to say to lead and and we've done some great leading like. The work share program, I can name so many things that PPS has led on in the last six months since I've been involved. I've been proud of, and this is one of those moments where we can say, we're actually gonna like help black kids. We're gonna expect high things from black kids. So it's, yes, it is like thinking positively, but it's also putting our collective effort 
towards making this, towards envisioning this and addressing all of the concerns about, you know, we're not going to have enough engage, engagement time and, you know, are we building for 1700 and are the ed specs being made, but rather what are we doing for the black community that we've never done before, that we have an opportunity to lead on, that we have an opportunity to like say, Danny Ledesma is like leading on this and pushing this and it requires her work and all of our work to get this done. Um, so I was just sharing with you what I heard. I wasn't trying to be critical of you as a person. I was sharing that I heard resistance to, to developing the full amazing scope of work that could happen at Jefferson due to these like little, you know, questions and concerns about population density or community engagement, or maybe there's like a classroom bigger than the one at Lincoln or whatever it is. And that we have an opportunity now as a, as a group, as everyone on this call to work towards getting that, getting that on the ground, getting a shovel in the ground and, and, and recognizing that vision um, that this community has had for like 50 years, literally we've envisioned it. It's just never so, happened. But what, when are the, um, I know I went on and on and on, but yeah, yeah. I feel very passionate about it. And, and I've talked to some community leaders in the last few days that have the same passion and are waiting for us to do better. So yeah. Michelle, my question is about like, as that neighborhood changes and infill comes, has there, have there been conversations about gentrification? I mean, if it goes to a 1700 comprehensive high school, will Will the kids that we want to serve, uh, the black students especially, will they be pushed out of that neighborhood? What's your sense around that? So the city of Portland has a thing called the preference policy, and that is uh, came out of the Portland Housing Bureau in 2016. It was all legally challenged. It's 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 a thing. It's a preference policy that anything any city investment that happens within a certain boundary gives preferences to those who currently live in the boundary have lived or grandparents or guardians have lived in. So this goes back, affects people going back. Um, it would be like my grandparents generation. If you had an address in this neighborhood in 1947, you were entitled to a preference. You get preference over someone that doesn't have that historic um, history here in, in housing. And that's middle income, middle wage housing. That's housing for people that make 80% of the median income or approximately, I think for one person, it's about maybe 38,000. For a family of four, it's about $44,000 in Portland in this year. And so the preference policy is helping to stabilize black families in North Northeast Portland. The gentrification has definitely happened and it's still happening. But with the combination of these zoning changes and the preference policy working in concert together and an anti-displacement um, policy that's being worked on currently, there is recognition that black people have not been able to own land um, and, and have not been able to become homeowners. And we're trying to change that. Like as a, as a city community where we are working to address what we see happening on the ground and that will make an impact in, on, on who we see living in these neighborhoods. So, I wanted to say one topic about also about the enrollment is I think it would be useful at a future date for um, the board to get a presentation. Um, it's one that I had a chance to see that uh, Principal uh, Calvert um, shared with the other high school principals regarding um, the enrollment areas because Jefferson is the only high school. So Benson is. It's a citywide focus program, but Jefferson is the only, only traditional neighborhood high school in which the school district, the board and staff leadership have given people an option, an opportunity to go somewhere else. Um, so they have a sort of two choices. And uh, again, Jefferson's the only uh, neighborhood high school that has that. And if you actually gave Jefferson a boundary and a high school that, um, parents would want to send their kids to because of the condition of the building and that had a modern facility. Um, I think we'd see a very different, a very different um, student population there. But right now, through district policies that really came about in the late 2009s, and they were an aftermath of No Child Left Behind and some of the, the, the federal policies that really 
um, had huge impacts on Marshall, Roosevelt, and Jefferson. And we still have a lasting vestige of the no child left behind that only pertains to the Jefferson community. There's no other high school in which we say, by the way, you live in the Jefferson, you live in this high neighborhood to high school boundary, but you can go to another um, another high school. And I I think it would be a great topic. And Director Bailey, you have been sort of a champion and one of the board that's experts on um, enrollment uh, and, and enrollment balancing issues and equity um, related to the enrollment. I think it would be a great topic for the board to look at because when people when people point to Jefferson's low enrollment, it's it's a low enrollment because just just like how Benson at one point had been capped is because of actions by the district, not necessarily by the by the community. So I think it would be a great topic to dive into, and I'd love to hear your take um, sort of on 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 the numbers um, based on that. So Good, I, Leah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, Thank you. And I think, you know, we the, the district started the middle college program as basically an experiment with, again, unique, the dual uh, enrollment areas uh, were unique to Jefferson. And, um, and I'm trying to remember the first year of that program. I'm thinking eight years ago, seven or eight years ago, somewhere in there. Um, and we, we've never, uh, certainly we can see, wow, graduation rates have, have gone up. Um, and it's the only program with uh, only high school in the city where with such a tight relationship where students can get uh, all the way up to an associate's de uh, degree through PCC. So it's not your average neighborhood of high school. It's it's different in a number of ways. The program is unique in a number of ways. And in some, as far as I can figure out, some really good ways. We've never done an evaluation of that. Uh, what have we learned from that? What's, what's working? What, if any, alterations do we need to make to make it even better? Uh, but it's certainly some really positive things have happened there. It would be nice to to have an objective look at that. And, uh, you know, we're supposed to be a learning organization. Um, so, uh, you know, plan, do, evaluate. Let's let's do some evaluation um, so we can fine tune what we have to make it even better. Um, and what are the takeaways from it? So this is a relatively simple question, I think, but um, maybe back to Director Brim Edwards, but, uh, or maybe this to the entire board, if we, if we move forward with Jefferson, it sounds to me like we are also simultaneously making policy decision to redraw the boundaries to make it a neighborhood school and redraw the boundaries of, of, of the other three high schools that, that currently overlap. Um, one, I guess, is, is that an accurate depiction? And, and then I guess the second question I have is, do we know that that's what the community wants? And again, I'm a relatively new board member, so I'm, I'm coming in with this, you know, sort of trying to understand here. And, and if the answer to that is yes, if, if, if we over the years know that that is exactly what the community wants, then that will make me much more comfortable. I am a little concerned that I have not been involved in that engagement process, and, I, and I'm not sure I'm not sure how involved that you know we have been in that. So I, I guess it's sort of an open question for me. What what does the community want for this high school? Because I want to I want to get behind. Actually, I want to march arm in arm with Director to pass that if this is the vision for the community, um, I, I want to be there leading on, on pushing this forward. But I also want to make sure that we don't make some of the same mistakes. Of, of a majority white board, not all white any longer, but a majority white board sitting here making decisions about what Jefferson's going to look like. I want to make sure we've engaged the community effectively as we do that. Yeah, so uh, what I've heard from leaders that have um, the wherewithal to speak for other black leaders is um, unequivocally uh, time to support Jefferson in this way. Un unequivocally the time to uh, make those investments in that part of town. Um, and, and they wanna stand by us and help get that work done. They're not, they're, um, people are ready for this project. And I know you have some concerns about, uh, you know, full engagement, but we have a network, like there's a network here. Um, 
we have a bat signal we can put out and people are interested and they are watching and they're watching tonight. And, and so, um, you know, we still, even with me, I mean, we're even with me on the board, we're still mostly white. Like I just, I was supposed to be returning from Scotland tonight on a DNA trip. So, um, I, I, I know unequivocally the community in and around North and Northeast Portland wants to see this happen. Um, there's a hundred percent support for it. I haven't heard otherwise uh, from anybody that doesn't want to, and anything that you have, any concerns that you have, um, confident could be addressed. Uh, we're smart people. We, we, we know how to address these things. And I, and I think that the thing is to do is to think about like moving forward and not putting up uh, any roadblocks to the project, I guess. Yeah, so I I want to I want to be really intentional about what I'm saying here because I I agree and I want to move this forward and and uh, you know I absolutely want to do that. I think the trade off is not moving it forward or not moving it forward. The trade off is moving it forward with engagement about what it's going to look like. And here's here's my concern. To be really direct about it, we include 320 million dollars in this bond. We are deciding. It sounds like about what the what the school is going to look like in the future. Um, we're deciding to move forward with an advisory group process that's, that's happened to date, and we're limiting some of the flexibility. I have heard really interesting ideas about maybe we want to move to maybe as part of this um, issue with I-5, and maybe we can get the state to pay for a big chunk of that. Um, maybe we want to move Tubman to this campus. Maybe we want to look at, at Kairos, as, as, as uh, Director Lowry said earlier. Those options are not included in what we're talking about. So I am actually worried that moving forward quickly will show support but then we will also start hearing from the community about other options, other ideas that maybe haven't been fully vetted that we will not have funding for because we wouldn't have gone through that planning process. And so I guess my, my question, and I'm, I, you know, we have two to three weeks now to engage, which is not a very long time, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm totally in favor of engaging around that. I wanna make sure we're engaging around the, the question though, because it's not a question of moving forward or not. There are seven members of this board that wanna see Jefferson build. And we want to see Jefferson built as quickly as we can. Um, to me, it's a question of what does it look like once it's built. And and if if it, it, you know, Michelle, if if I'm if I hear from the community there is unanimity or at least a broad consensus, like I said, I'm I'm there. I just I need I need to make sure that that exists. Yeah, I, I don't. Think your other... your address is a scott at I, 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 I <laughs> it's that. a no, no no let me make sure you give it it's a n s c o t t at pps yeah a -N -S 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 no i yeah I, I i appreciate you saying that and concern so the black community has never in development processes as you know for the last like in my memory ever been consulted um so this is probably a good time to start um there's a lot of with the develop. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts, right? There's the highway project. You know, there's Alba Innovation. Um, there's the North Northeast. Um, there's a, a project happening on the corner of uh, Vancouver and Russell. Um, that's been an empty plot of land at the I think south end of the Emanuel campus. And so these things happen. They're they're all happening. And I it sounds like you want to put a placeholder so. We make sure we get the most, um, the best thing happening at the time. And we also, we some of these processes can happen concurrently. I believe um, if you look at a development Gantt chart and like the one that we looked at earlier about the bond timeline, we can overlap some of the processes that you're talking about um, in terms of engagement. Um, and like, and I asked earlier today where, where we were in the master planning cycle because a master planning cycle could um, do what they call bubbling and they can bubble um, future plans or something. And so so there's space um, available for any future um, additions to a campus type setting. Yes, but I want to be clear, include 320 million. And realize after, after going through that process over the next six to 12 months, that really what we need is a $350 million project. We won't have the money to do it. And, and that's the risk that I want to make sure that we're addressing in this process. So I think there's very little risk if we build Jefferson, that the Jefferson High School community is going to say that's not the high school they wanted. So in 2011, they were on the bond. And then when that bond lost by 900 votes for reasons other than Jefferson, 
they were then, then they didn't go on the 2012 bond, then they didn't go on the 2017 bond. And I know during this meeting, we all got a copy of the letter from Principal Calvert that was the explanation to the community of why they didn't go in 2017. And, uh, you know, we can, we can perf you're, we're never gonna get un unanimity. You're, you won't have that for any high school. There were different opinions on grant at Franklin. I know there's still people talking about Franklin in the community about like, well, they would have liked Franklin to be a little bit different or why didn't we, you know, make this one change, you know, to this building that we were attached to. Um, so I don't think you're ever going to get unanimity, but I, I have heard very clearly for the last two bonds from the Jefferson community about the high school. So there's never an end to other things that could be added, but I think there's a certain point in time where you can put a stake in the ground. And I don't think, um, I, I'm just going to hazard a guess based on conversations I've had over the last six months that um, if you ask people, should we go ahead with Jefferson or should we wait and have a much longer planning process and wait for the next bond, that you will get pretty close to unanimity of we should go now, we should go now with the high school and the other pieces, like the Albina vision is a, as Rakaya Adams says, a multi-decade vision, and it's not all going to happen in the next five years, but it's going to roll out over several decades. Yeah, Julie, can I just, I think I want to be clear though, um, the, al the alternative here doesn't actually delay Jefferson build at all. It does put it on a future bond, which increases the risk and I'll acknowledge that, but but you just said it would extend the planning process and the, the construction and, and actually it would it would not. So so again, the options that I want to make sure we're, we're going to the community really transparently about are that um, we can include funding now. And if we include funding now, um, it will, it, and it passes, right? Then it will be certain that the funding will be there. It will also limit the options for that campus and for that site. Or we can include funding and significant funding, 25, 30 million dollars for planning, construction, design, engagement, community, you know, engagement, et cetera. And, and, and end up at the end of that process, the end of that two year process with a really defined, this is exactly what the community wants. And then we go back out in 2022 with a plan to do that. So I acknowledge there's risk in that latter approach and, and I can be convinced to do this former approach, but I don't, I wanna be really transparent with the community. The approach of including funding now limits and narrows our options for what Jefferson's going to look like. And they need to understand that trade-off when we engage them on this process. I think, I think that's a great Director question Scott, to ask them. Segue, it's a good segue back to just our decision making process that's in front of us. And I'm glad that we're having this robust conversation about um, Jefferson because um, we do have the options on the table that include doing the design documents for Jefferson and for the other two high schools. Um, it would keep the same construction as uh, the same timeline getting those done if we went back to the voters in two years. And so what we really, and I agree with you that, um, I actually agree with both of you, which is that um, there is great enthusiasm in the community for not deferring this decision anymore because the Jefferson community does feel that they've been um, deferred with the last two bonds. And if we were to not go forward with all of our high school modernizations on this bond, which was the expectation of that community that 2020 was finally their time, um, there would be a lot of disappointment and a lot of just um, triggering of decades of broken promises. Um, but but the question before us now is really um, back to the big picture of how big a bond are we willing to go out with? How comfortable are we with the conceptual master plan notions of Jefferson as opposed to um, further specificity on budget and design. Um, I think that this is where we really haven't had much conversation since our conversations in our last few meetings have been winnowing down to a smaller bond. Um, so I think it would be good to hear people's thoughts generally about, okay, if we want to, um, if we want to include, you know, Jefferson as an option for full construction, um, that puts us at close to a billion dollars, which is not something that we've been talking about in the last few times we've gotten together. So, so I think it's worth hearing people's perspectives there. Yeah. So um, can I just say, I think we have three great 
options in front of us. And I, I feel comfortable uh, going out to the community with those options. I think we've uh, talked about some of the issues involved and sort of pros and cons for those options. I think that's this has been a great discussion. Um, you know, bringing those out and more more food for thought for us and the community going forward. So uh, I think we could have some really uh, spirited and good good spirited community discussions and get some good input on each of those options going forward. Um, and I think that's a great segue of what you just said. Let's talk about though, and it's not even though, let's talk about the ramifications of um, a billion dollar bond in a two year, uh, <laughs> billion dollars in two year, um, when the last bond we had was a four year with 700 million and, and how that works out. I mean, do we wanna make that two year? Do we wanna make that four year instead? How does that affect future financing? Um, those kind of questions I think are important to, um, I, I think is where you were trying to focus us for the next. Can, next be, be, sorry, um, this is Rita. I think before we move on to that, um, we actually have six options on the table. And um, I think six is way too many. Um, so I think we should at least, I mean, three, I think three is doable to get some feedback. Um, but we've got low end and high end on three concepts. And I think we, I think we need to make a decision about what of those six options we really want to put before the community. And if I could just step in for a second on a process issue. So we are we are in a work session. And so um, actually we won't be making a decision, but what we are doing is giving some guidance to staff so that they can come back with these options. And so um, just like just like Chair Constam just asked for sort of feedback, um, we're gonna be uh, repeatedly now for the rest of the meeting sort of sort of going around round robin and hearing from board members. Staff are gonna take that. Um, and superintendent's going to take that, and then and then um, hopefully that's enough to sort of narrow down. So I just I just want to be really clear: we're not we're not we are not as a board sort of deciding which options tonight. We're expressing our views. They'll then take that and make some decisions. Thanks for that clarification. You know, um, I used to work as an interior designer, and um, I noticed when you get more than three options for somebody, you know, you're doing like three different renderings and three different cost packages. It doesn't work out really well to have more than three is all I'm saying. So I'm hoping that we can narrow it down tonight too. What, what does anybody know what an ideal number is to bring out to the community? Is it like scenario A or B? Well, I'd be interested in hearing people's ideas on um, the areas where we have had more conversation in our last few meetings around the proposals from the superintendent and staff on technology and on curriculum and also see if there are any remaining questions. We do have a fair bit of detail in um, all of our materials tonight about what the what numbers made up those aggregate numbers for technology and curriculum. So um, I have a slightly different question, but on the same area. It's not the specifics of those ranges. I think I have a pretty good idea of those. It's, um, and pick which, um e either uh 1b or 2b have are the sort of high end options i think we referred to them what what are the ramifications so I, i'm going to ask an impossible question of staff and I, I think it's pretty impossible if we were looking at a 40-year time span so right right there stop laughing um and and we were doing back of the envelope at what date could we see all of the schools in pps modernized either you know torn down or rebuilt depending on the building or gutted and rebuilt so that they're safe they're accessible they're modern learning spaces uh they're energy efficient uh, you know all of those qualities that we want in our schools 
what's what's the rough timeline on that? And there's trade-offs going forward in terms of how much we put into non-modernization versus modernization. And there's there's again good reasons for for doing non-modernization things. Um, we started out this bond program in 2012, trying to minimize the non-modernization, maximize the modernization, because that seemed to be the most cost-efficient going forward of getting as many of our students as quickly as possible into safe, accessible, modern learning spaces. Um, so if we went with, uh, one of those B's instead of an A, how, you know, there, there's a risk in going with A because we might have some systems fail that we didn't get around to fixing. Um, and there's a risk in going with A because it, the, the more we put into the current, the farther out that modernization you know, goes. 30 years, does it become 40 years? Um, so I'm thinking along those lines. I don't know if, if that was very coherent, but I, I'd be interested in a staff response on that, just generically on that issue. Was that clear? Um, Director Bailey, I believe what you're asking for is a long range facilities plan. And luckily our staff is starting that process as the district uh, does a long range facility plan every 10 years and we're due. And so while I don't believe tonight we can answer your question, I, I do believe that we do need that long range planning so that we can really get to, if, if we are, go out 40 years and we know the conditions of our current buildings and what we want, um, what we need to um, continue to do and how long it will take, that's what that long range facility plan is for. And it can help us with also creating the stair steps. Um, I don't think it needs to, you know, we don't need to wait for it. We should go forward as, as we're going now, but we have lots of room for planning and that long-term range, that long range thinking um, as we continue to evolve. We know that it will be decades for us to get through, get on to where all of our um, buildings are modernized. So we are committed to bringing that work back to the community and the board in a, in a process. That that would be awesome. And I know statutorily we're due for a 2022, I think it's every 10 years, we uh, are required by the state to prepare that plan. So I appreciate that work has started on that. The last one we did was a great values document, but not a plan. And that's part of why we're struggling somewhat right now. Um, and it's a good struggle, but with that, a, a better framework. Uh, and even though, I, and I appreciate what you said, Andrew, about, wow, we're ahead of, <laughs> of other local governments because we we have a plan and a, and a funding mechanism. That's true uh, to a certain extent. I would like to be more true uh, in terms of having a more defined plan going forward. But I, I, so I think that's a long way of saying, um, as we look at the difference between an A option and a B option, those are the trade-offs that we should be very clear on. Um, they're, they're both attractive, depending on your, your point of view in terms of, let's put more money into modernization. That's, the, that's really important versus uh, oh my gosh, we want to safeguard against an HVAC system, a heating system going out in the middle of winter in one of our schools, um, that, that kind of catastrophic failure. Um, so I wonder, uh, I'll just throw that out as an idea, of maybe if we want to do, uh, uh, I'll, I'll throw it out as, as, as off the top thinking right now, doing maybe a 1A, a 2B, and a 3B, um, where either one or two is a lower uh, dollar amount, and one of them is a higher dollar amount for uh, those non-modernization pieces, mm -hmm. and that three is sort of a full meal deal. 
um, that would include that um, extra curriculum money. So I'll just, that's top of head thinking or food for thought for others. So one thing I would be, if I were looking at sort of the urgent, the urgent needs versus um, some of the longer term modernizations, I would um, be supportive of lowering the amount of dollars for curriculum that's in there in this um, in any of the options. Um, it's not something that we've ever used the bond to pay for, and I know I know we, I know we can. Um, but I think if, if I were looking at, you know, what are the most urgent things, I think the technology we've got, um, you know, plenty of recent examples of why we need this infrastructure um, in place for our students, whether or not they're distance learning or in the classroom, but just really to be ready for the uh, 21st century. And I think the health and safety pieces have been well documented. I just, if, if I were to look at where, what are, what are things that could be play, paid for with other um revenues curriculum to me belongs in the operating bucket versus the capital bucket julia can i just ask on that i mean everything we have on the table here can be paid for out of other um out of other funds uh, but i guess are, are we are you are you suggesting maybe as part of our budget process we look for cuts in the district to, to pay for curriculum in the operating side I'm suggesting that we pay for it the way that we traditionally have paid for it, which is out of our operating operating dollars. So generally, most of these other items, almost all these other items, um, we have uh, paid for using um, you know cap, cap the capital program or, or bonds. And so curriculum is when I look at this list, one of the things that um, we traditionally have paid for out of op our operating dollars or our general fund. Yeah, I guess I would just say that I think we haven't, sorry, just just we we haven't paid for it, which is why we have a curriculum that's 20 or 30 years old. So I think that right. that is the issue. And and I guess I I I I also hear what the superintendent of staff have said about how important that is to the actual achievement of kids in our district. Um so that that it to me, I it feels to me like we have to be updating the curriculum. I, I don't disagree there are other ways we can do it, but but I worry the operating side, those those cuts. Um, would also have an impact um, on on learning, whether it's cutting teachers or, or programs in order to pay for curriculum. So, uh, I'm in favor of keeping some. Uh, may I ask I a question? The, just, I think the. I'm sorry. May, go ahead. May I ask a question for clarification? And actually, because we, when someone stops talking, we actually all pile in. I wonder if there's a way in this program to raise your hand. Just throwing that out there. I know I interrupt a lot because I'm from a big family, but I wouldn't mind raising my hand. I agree on larger calls. That would be helpful. I haven't seen that feature on Webex, but we can we can look to do there. We, we maybe we do hand signals or something. Um, it would. So my mom's a you know my parents are both retired educators. My dad's an economics professor. My mother was you know taught at at King Elementary, and I still don't understand. I know what curriculum is, but I'm wondering, like, what does it entail? What is it? What does twenty four point nine million dollars get us that we don't have today? And I'm not asking that to be snarky. I really am interested in hearing like is that is that like culturally appropriate materials is that updated textbooks um is that looking at learning outcomes considering what we know now and we didn't know 30 years ago and i'm just i'm just curious i just i literally don't know so well, roseanne are you able to link to some of the materials uh from our packet that go into detail about the the curriculum um that dr valentino has has put forward to us a couple of times and i just wanted to make a, a a comment about curriculum that um i i agree that in a high functioning school district uh, we should be able to accommodate curriculum and refresh curriculum and keep you know culturally relevant relevant and topical curriculum um available on an ongoing basis out of the general fund um however i think the reason that we do have this proposal before us from the superintendent for this capital ask is because we have such a serious deficit and if we're if we're committed to really addressing our disparities in achievement and in raising student achievement generally um we've got to be able to address 
some of these these core issues because I don't I don't see the ability to do that with our general fund certainly in this budget cycle. But Julie, I don't disagree with you. I would I would um, I support including curriculum in this capital ask here, and then um, I support having a responsible plan for refreshing and updating, man maintaining out of our general fund on a regular basis. But uh, the school boards before us, us did not do that or were not able to do that. And that's why we're in the hole we're in now. Can I weigh in on that too? This is Rita. Um, yeah, I agree. The, the way PPS has done, uh, has funded curriculum in the past is that it hasn't. Um, and um, we never had a uh, an annual budget line for curriculum. That was just that every year you would invest, which is what a, I presume uh, normal districts do. So I, um, I feel pretty strongly that um, we have an opportunity here to jumpstart the curriculum work um, that I think is 20 years behind the times. Um, and I can't imagine um, us being able to make up the deficit in existing curriculum any other way. Um, the other argument I would make is, um, one of the perpetual complaints from families about the bond program is that um, every bond picks out, you know, a relatively few schools that see enormous benefits. Um, and then other schools, maybe if they're lucky, get some benefits in, you know, a, a, furnace, a new furnace maybe, or um, some other terribly unsexy um, improvement um, that's not nothing, but um, if we invest in curriculum, it means that every student in every school is going to see some benefit from this bond. Um, and I, I think that could be significant. Um, and while I've got the floor, I'll just say um, I, I'm not afraid of going to the, the B word. Um, I think a billion dollars over four years makes sense to me. I appreciate your comments, um, Director Moore, uh, but I um, I think mechanical systems that work are pretty sexy. I would say also we're, um, it's just worth noting that the uh, technology um, up upgrades and, and the devices that every student would have, I think, is also um pretty compelling um just in terms of what what we now know um are um that have been the spotlight's been put on the deficiencies that we have in our district so i i do think there's a lot of things we could talk about um and i guess just back to the curriculum you know i think we have a, there's an opportunity every year for um choices to be made and they haven't been made in the past but it's not that um it's not that it's not an option. Um, so if, if I, just my own preference, I would reduce the curriculum number somewhat, not to that full level. And, um, you know, I look at the other projects and almost all of them are going to be, um, the great thing um, is gonna be that they are going to actually support jobs and employment um, and create um, better and improved buildings and modernized buildings in our community and the curriculum, unless we're buying it locally, is going to be go out of, you know, the money's going out of state. Um, okay. I, think I, I just want to add, I think I happen to know that the superintendent got an earful from a sophomore that I know just yesterday about part of the reason that we have such persistent inequities and deep systemic racism in this country is because kids don't have enough opportunity to learn about our racial history 
and that we have, you know, ethnic studies. We're, we're just beginning to implement our ethnic studies curriculum, but it's uh, it's nowhere near the 21st century education that it that it should be Im embedded and integrated across all content areas, across all grade levels. And this is coming from a kid who was recognizing that if we're and if we're going to be serious about addressing these issues, we need to start with education about our past. And we know we have our kids are using social studies texts that are outdated and from um, uh, uh, putting forth a lot of a lot of implicit or explicit bias. So um, I was I was trying the hand raising thing. It it didn't <laughs> work, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, and this is under, you know, consist, uh, consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds or something like that. I, in previous meetings, argued fairly passionately for an eight year bond um, with no curriculum. And I've swung back around to a two year bond with curriculum. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I, I thought you'd appreciate that. Um, and, and here's why. Part of it is the planning issue. Uh, I think Andrew has raised some of those issues, uh, which would not affect the actual timing of the start of construction uh, um, for, uh, for Jefferson, um, were we to go down that route. And uh, a second piece is, um, is equity. Uh, we did have, we had, we had no curriculum department uh, back in the late 90s and through about 2004, I think, when it got reestablished. And then we started doing curriculum updates on a regular basis. And then in the 2008-2009 recession, that got suspended. And basically not much, Some uh, there, there's some language arts, but not much has happened since then um until the last couple of years um so we are behind this is a huge equity issue if we're to, to hit our um uh, our goals for increasing um student performance um i think we need that curriculum uh now and i think uh what what amy just referred to in terms of uh, uh integrating uh, ethnic studies into our social studies curriculum, you know, from, from K to 12 um, is a big part of that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I could uh, support a, I, I'll call it a one time to be um, a one time major support of curriculum out of the bond. Um, and and looking at then getting on more, uh, hopefully a more sustainable model through operating expenses rather than, than a bond. Dr. Lowry, I have a question. Um, I, didn't speak. Um, I just wanted to let people know because I just discovered it myself. There is a way to raise your hand, but we would need <laughs> someone to be in charge of monitoring who has their hands up and that's a job for somebody. I'm just saying, like, there is a way if you go into the participants, there's a little person, like a, a head with a body. Um, and then if you go into the list of participants, there's you can where you can mute your microphone, your video, and you can raise your hand. But that would require a moderator, someone to volunteer for that. Um, I still haven't really heard uh, enough about the curriculum, but there's so much content online and <laughs> And and so I'm just like I'm one, I'm trying to imagine like 29 million, and I appreciate the effort to talk about uh, equity. Um, we can do as much as we can in the schools around uh, social studies and teaching racial equity, but a lot of that you know racism actually is learned at home. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know. And and my other concern is we're purchasing curriculum from whom. And are those, is that $29, $29.4 million being spent outside of our local area? Is that leaving the economy? Are you going to other vendors that 
that aren't that that don't have to live with us like don't have to be our neighbors or is there a way to invest that those dollars locally knowing the impact of every single dollar we spend in our own community the understanding the ripple effect in that community and is there a way to source curriculum from the communities that we already have here um, and the vendors that we already have here to benefit our economy at the same time as helping um our students, which is our ultimate goal. So, Superintendent Guerrero, I wonder if you might just briefly weigh in here. Um, you've talked a little bit before, it's been it's been a while, but um, when you initially framed this ask on curriculum, you talked a little bit before about what that adoption and refresh cycle um, is for high functioning school districts and what you found when you arrived here and and just generally what the impetus was for um, looking at this as a capital investment. You want to revisit that conversation briefly? I'm sure Chair Constam and staff and I have been listening very attentively, taking notes. Uh, tracking the, the board's uh, ongoing, evolving uh, conversation. Uh, and I think Chair Constan, you and others, you know, have, have described uh, the severe curriculum debt that exists in the district. Uh, maybe if our students had access to more accurate and current culturally responsive critical racial history materials, uh, it would help us um, make sure we have uh, our we're graduating students with, you know, those kind of critical understandings. And uh, I agree, if, if there was uh, a degree of consistent uh, investment over time, year after year, on a cycle across content areas, uh, we wouldn't be in this predicament. Uh, and so this represents an opportunity uh, to try to get caught up and then get back on a cycle. I think when you look at the listing of proposed investments, you'll see they're actually pretty modest amounts to be spent across a dozen plus content areas, um, whether it's math, social studies, health, uh, PE, arts, uh, language arts. Uh, some of them are Division 22 requirements. I'll remind the board uh, that we haven't been in compliance with Division 22 state requirements precisely because our curriculum is not up to date. Uh, and so I, I don't know how we get there uh, over time, but I understood our one of our key missions is student achievement. Uh, and in order to be able to do that, uh, that requires high quality uh, material. So I can't, I can't emphasize enough uh, it would be alarming to not make an investment in this area. I would propose other trade-offs, um, or certainly we cannot put them in this bond, but then that would require other hard uh, decisions. Uh, and we're already uh, facing, um, you know, not, not an optimal uh, economic environment as it is, where we're already uh, making those choices. Um, what I've heard tonight a little differently, and I think I started the meeting off uh, by affirming, and I think last Tuesday night's uh, sharing of our strategic plan priorities, uh, I applaud any time that we can uh, steer the conversation through a racial equity lens and applaud an emphasis, uh, in this case, in Portland's historically predominantly black high school. Uh, great. Um, but uh, I also don't, the racial equity lens d demands that we sort of be in dialogue with those that decisions like this would impact the most. And I know that on some level they've been involved, but I heard clearly that the board would very much welcome a, a deeper conversation with community stakeholders, uh, because if we're going to build a fabulous facility with, that can host a lot of exciting programming, I want us to meet all those desires uh, that the community may have. Um, and so I would want us to, to make sure we, we, we do some meaningful uh, engagement, you know, that, that goes, uh, that helps all of us have a fuller understanding of, of, of what the goals there are. So uh, I, I, I believe safe, modern, warm, dry uh, buildings are, are, should be a guarantee to any one of our students. 
uh, no matter what campus they step foot on. Um, but if you have a modern building and 30 year old textbooks, uh, you know, there's, there's a little bit of a, uh, a, a pendulum or, or, or balance that, that, that's, that's, that's missing there. So uh, I would hope that, that we maintain some degree of investment uh, in curriculum or, or think about how we sequence the technology work, which is also, uh, you know, subject to failures that, that would not be good for, for our school district uh, in the same way that I've heard board members talk about the need for seismic and, and, and roofs. Uh, I think we would all agree there are lots of areas um, that, were, that were deficient and we have an opportunity to try to present a compelling package that the broader community could be supportive of and i think we can get there i just uh tonight's conversation was to help us think about how we continue to do the public engagement um and i'm hearing that certainly the jefferson community is is one that we need to engage more deeply um and then i do think it's important to to speak with community stakeholders about the other areas uh too so we have a little bit better sense of what our our our, our primary stakeholders would, would be supportive of. So uh, it, it's been an um, informative conversation to be listening to. Could I, um, could I ask the superintendent to um, elaborate just a little bit on the curriculum question? Um, so I, I am in receipt from a number of people of um, questions why we would need to have that level of investment in curriculum when there's so much uh, online that is uh, available for free where teachers develop their own curriculum um, again you know using primarily um, free resources um, so what is it that this 29 million dollars would be spent on <clears throat> Um, sure, I, I won't ask our CAO to give us a, a seminar on the spot tonight uh, about it, but when you see um, health and uh, a level of investment that uh, uh, it's important that we provide our health educators and students with an ability to teach to those revised standards, uh, we have a million dollars uh, we're proposing to spend in sixth through twelfth grade world languages materials. Um, Portland offers a very attractive array of dual language and world language uh, program options. We want to make sure they have the materials, um, you know, in those languages, those native languages uh, available to students. And then there's some areas in here that are directly related to some of the opportunity gaps we have. So when you see a modest investment of 2.5 million across K to 12, in English as a second language materials, well, you know, could it be that part of the gap that we're observing from that student group is due to the fact that they haven't had integrated and designated core curriculum in English as a second language? Um, I'm guessing that might be the case. Uh, for some of our core content curriculum textbooks, they, they're out of print. They were published before even the last learning standards. So yes, I agree. Teachers have had to get very creative in pulling things um, uh, from other resources and we count on their professional judgment. And uh, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, pallets of textbooks showing up, showing up at the front doors of campuses. Uh, the, these investments would represent uh, digital content resources as well and loading up a learning platform that our students could access or that our teachers could pull lessons and, and resources from. So yes, uh, uh, there's a lot of rich material out there that's available online, but you, you still need a, an ability to organize and invest in those materials. We've seen those inequities across our schools. You have some schools uh, buying uh, software licenses for a limited number of students. Uh, but the school down the street uh, doesn't have access to a similar level uh, of resource. And so we really do have to have a systems approach to make sure every student has access to rich content. Uh, and then I think as we make these initial investments and you look at Oregon, State of Oregon's revised curriculum cycle, you know, we can get back on track with each year making that sequenced investment 
uh, in updating or replenishing, in some cases, think of science uh, materials uh, for the work that, that needs to happen in our labs and in our classrooms. Um, so that's what that represents. We've spoken about our master arts education plan and the need to fill in uh, visual and performing arts pathway gaps. Uh, you, you need materials, you need musical instruments, you need visual art supplies. Um, that's part of that ongoing uh, investment there uh, as well. So uh, that, that's my quick uh, attempt at, at providing a synopsis around. Um, <laughs> it seems a little silly to have to answer the question, but it's a good question. Uh, why does curriculum matter in schools? Um, <laughs> Superintendent Guerrero, my on the ground anecdote to that is when uh, the PE mandate and the new health stuff was rolled out and uh, the way the schedule was at Selwood for a hot minute, um, art teachers were going to have to teach sixth, seventh and eighth grade kids in a mixed class sex ed and the curriculum wasn't finished yet. And so if you want to see teachers panic, um, just remember back to middle school and if you would like sixth graders and eighth graders in the same room while you're discussing, you know, they're changing bodies with no curriculum. Um, of course, the district got it all worked out eventually, but th there was, you know, um, a lot of teachers questioning their life choices in that moment. I've been in that situation and therefore is the argument for making sure that as a school system, we have an organized scope and sequence for every one of our content areas. That's the least uh, we could do to ensure equity and access of, of the instructional program. So um, I, I want to kind of come back to a question that Director Moore posed and, and other people I think are posing as well. Just if you could clarify, okay, six million plus for math. Uh, and, and the question we hear sometimes or we have sometimes ourselves is, Oh, why don't you just go on on the web, grab a bunch of free stuff? Granted, you have to pay for staff to do that and and to organize that. Uh, what are are we? Why is there a need to buy stuff if it's by materials or lesson plans or um, if if it's out there free? I mean that that's kind of the question that that bubbles up. Well, could you could you give a little more detail on on how how that works in in reality? Sure, and and I think I'll invite our chief academic officer uh, if you could succinctly uh, try to express why what that investment represents and how it might be a balance of sources uh, for for teaching materials, uh, Dr. Valentino. Hi, good evening, board member, superintendent. So th these are in incredibly good questions and some that sometimes we take for granted because we're in this 24 seven. The, the, the primary purpose for having a curriculum that is centralized, um, that is consistent with best practices and research on the, the teaching of math is that it brings coherence and alignment across the system. One of the goals that you've articulated in math, for example, is that we follow a sequence from first grade, third grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, and into high school. That requires that we are consistent in how those, the scope and sequence of those standards are being taught, and that the curriculum is rigorous enough to support the students being able to achieve those standards as they go through the, through the system, so that we actually meet the goals that have been identified at each particular grade level. When we, uh, when we purchase uh randomly or when we go online and we download we do have numerous documents that can actually work together they have not been vetted for the level of rigor that would suggest that at every school they would be implemented consistently um, and so one of the things that we that we've learned through the pandemic and the closure of schools is how important a curriculum that is actually aligned across the system will help to address the gap that has that will will have increased because of the closure, and so the more consistency we can provide across all disciplines, teachers can focus on the planning and instruction, and not in developing of the curriculum. Because if we compile our own curriculum, then it it will be it will become the responsibility of others as well 
to develop and align the curriculum so that it actually is standardized across the standards that we have set as a school district and as a state by purchasing a program that is now that would that, that if you're looking at math at bridges which is now 22 to 25 years old which is prior to the standards we would be purchasing something that is standards aligned and then the professional development would focus on how to use this program to teach the various student populations you have the with the cultural sensitivity with the emotional sensitivity that is required right the elements be, but if we don't, then we're now asking teachers to also become curriculum developers uh, because each school will then choose which sources they, they, they use, how they come together to plan, and in some cases it would be by grade level, in some cases it would be teacher by teacher. What we're trying to do through the adoption is one, to build in the internal coherence to teaching and learning that has not existed in the system for a long time. Number two, to put us back on the cycle that in the long term will be less expensive to do to be on the Oregon curriculum adoption cycle. Right. And number three, it gives us the opportunity to now begin to balance between the uh, analog materials paper with the digital materials. And so one of the things that we're doing with the publishers is talking about how in this new environment that we're all moving into those resources will support the learning both in the classroom, but also in the home. So we're trying to couple that experience for the teacher and the student and understand the return this year is going to be an incredible lift for teachers, incredible. And the more that we can provide for them that they don't have to worry about, the better off the students will be, the better off the teacher will be, and the, the, the odds are greater that we will meet the expectations that we have set for ourselves as a school district. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Valentino. Um, Director Scott, I wondered if I might be able to uh, pass it back to you since you've sort of ably managed this process starting through the School Improvement Bond Committee of winnowing our options, um, looking at what we will be imminently taking out to the community. Um, do you want to try to see how we can uh, gauge individual directors' uh, yeah. interests here? Great. Yeah, no, thank you. And this is actually you, you, you had started this a little while ago and, and I think we got an answer from director Bailey, but we can, we can, we can also go back to him again. So just to remind everyone that the goal of tonight's work session is to hear from everybody, which we've been doing, which is fantastic about what the options are that we want to share um, out to the community for feedback. And so the superintendent can get a sense from the conversation about what, what, what to put in that process. And, and we just heard from him, you know, in terms of all the things he's been hearing, given the time it's 8 30, I figured let's, let's do another quick round um, and actually not everybody um, got in the first round. So let's do a quick round through all the board members. Um, and I think the, the key questions we're looking for are, uh, of the options of the six, um, how would you narrow that down? And then are there additional questions that you still have that, that either we can get an answer tonight or, or maybe we can also follow up offline if there are additional questions things that you would be interested in hearing more about. Um, and maybe we will just start in a round robin style and I will call on Director Moore. Okay, sorry. Um, well, I think I already said it. Um, I think my preference is the B. Um, and uh, because I want it all. And, um, and I think if we're gonna go big, we should go big. Um, and what else? Uh, what questions? Um, I don't think I have a question. I mean, I've asked a number of them um, here and offline. So um, I guess my, the thing I would um, like to emphasize, I guess, is um, I, I think um, if we're going to include Jefferson on this bond, and and I think it makes sense. Um, I, I think we need to almost immediately begin to um, really 
engage with um, the community and also all of our system partners, um, in particular PCC, um, to, to address the question of what will a new Jefferson look like? Um, what will be included? Um, because I think it's been, um, I think it has a, a real gap in its current um, array of offerings. And um, I think one of the things that we have learned over the last two bonds is that during the planning process, um, because the people who are most intimately involved with the process are, um, are the people who are currently there, um, what is in existence today has a huge impact on what is imagined for the future building. Um, so I want to make sure that we, we get Jefferson right. Um, and, and I think we can do it, but I think we need to really double down on, on planning um, if we're going to um, really make the best use of, uh, of this opportunity and, and provide the, the students at Jefferson with the kind of high school that they deserve. I, I think that's it. Great. Thank you. Uh, Let me just clarify for one second, please. So, Rita, when you say B, um, you referred earlier to a capital B, which is a close to a billion dollar bond, but I think you mean the greater option um, on the right side of the ledger in, in all categories. So, that yeah, would actually, be. I, th I think you said 3B. I said 3B. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said B. Yeah. yeah no, okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm talking about a billion dollars. So, if we're going to do it, do it. Never mind. Thank um, you very much. But, but it cannot be over two years. That's crazy. Yeah. So, I just have a question. Is the, was the three, the materials that we had in advance in the meeting didn't have the option three in it? Is that posted online? I know it's now on, the, on our screen, which is super helpful. Thank you, Rosa. Um, but is that, a document that got posted because it wasn't posted prior to the board meeting. It just would be useful for. So we, we can post it. I don't think it's been posted yet. I just asked for staff to create that just uh, before our meeting as a, because I wanted to have it as a talking point. This is Roseanne and yes, it's been posted. Okay. Great, thank you. Great. So Director Brim Edwards, why don't you go ahead? <sighs> yeah, so can I get all of three, please? Oh, I can't see it on my screen. Sorry, and I don't have it. Um, so um, I'm, I know we're, do you want to, let me just ask a clarifying question, uh, Andrew. Do you want um, us to say the three options that we want to have presented or like a preferred and then a secondary or? Yeah, so at this point, just, just indicating what do you think we should go out to the community and get feedback on? So it could be two, it could be three, it could be six, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I would say they would all need to be, should be uh, some variation of 3A because the one thing that's different from 3A from the others is it includes Jefferson. And um, as I said several meetings ago, the building um, is not really suitable for students and I think they've waited a long enough time so some variation on that I I would um, be interested in uh Superintendent Guerrero said that um he didn't want to trade off curriculum that he had some other places he'd rather cut and I'd be interested in that I think 988 is um maybe 50 million more than um I'd like to do that. So I would be interested in another some some variation of that, but definitely um, having Jefferson in you know, completely supportive of, of all the options that have, you know, Benson, the multiple pathways to graduation, technology, SPED and ADA, and sort of some sort of sliding scale on the rest. Great. Thank you. Any 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 uh, burning questions um, for staff? Well, I think, uh, just the question I mentioned, which is right. Uh, the That's right. You did, yeah. 
Um, yeah. And I, I guess one of the things, the questions I'd have for staff is I think it's going to be really important because I think there were a lot of questions yeah. that were raised tonight about Jefferson and I know it wasn't necessarily uh, prepared this way, but I think it would be super helpful of any future sessions we have um, or community sessions that we have um, the Jefferson principal um, available to answer these questions. I think many of these could have probably been easily answered by somebody who's been in the building for you know, about 10 years um, and leading the, the transformation there. So that's more of a request. Great, thank you. Um, Director DePass. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm um, I'm kind of going back between a couple screens. What we're seeing now that doesn't have well, I I can see the three options now. Thank you. And then the earlier materials that had options one a. I'm leaning toward the both of. I mean, my top choices would be um, my top choice would be three a or three b, and that's because they both include Jefferson. I know there's some fear about n not doing not doing it correctly. Um, my feeling is having lived in this area for a very long time is um, not doing anything with Jefferson is what doing it incorrectly looks like. Um, and of course, right now we have an opportunity to address that. Um, I'm completely in favor of the SPED classrooms. Um, the curriculum, I still have a lot of questions about. I'm not sure what that looks like. I, Maybe I wasn't listening very well, but I'm not sure what that looks like, and I'm not sure if uh, curriculum can be if if we have vendors locally or just in the Pacific Northwest even that can deliver help us deliver on that promise of you know giving an equitable opportunity for all students. Um, but yeah, I don't really want to even look at the options two and one because I want to just plant my my foot in the sand. Um, for the options that include Jefferson High School for multiple reasons. And um, and and I'm also willing to look at if there, I don't see it here on the screen, but if there were a hybrid between like if option 3B and 2B had a baby and, you know, the, the mechanical and some of that infrastructure work could happen which I know is very important from a facilities perspective, and we get the new high school in the area I've lived in most of my life. That's that's important. And so, yeah, so that, sorry, it's limited. 3A would be my, or B would be my top choices. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, uh, Director Lowry. Sorry, I'm in the sunglasses land because we're back to migraines. Um, I have ordered new clear sun clear glasses that'll help with the blue glare on the screen. Anyway, um, I'm gonna make up my own three options that I would like taken out. Um, I think the first one would be to to take out these three options to the public and see what our community is saying. Uh, the first one would be the two year that we had kind of initially discussed the was basically a third of the money going to Benson and multiple pathways to graduation, a third going to those ed enrichments, including curriculum, technology, and the SPED classrooms, and then a third going to those sort of critical facilities, including some of that um, ADA work, the mechanical and the roofs. So that'd be sort of like the base option, which is what we've been talking about for a little bit. My second option would be to include in all of those planning for all three high schools to do some of that beginning of the that two year design work that Dan had talked about. And then the third option I would want to take out to the community would be an option that would include building Jeff and design work for the other two high schools. Um, I know uh, Director Brim Edwards talked about that Jeff was on that 2011 bond. Um, Cleveland was also on that bond that failed. And so while it's a very different community, that community too feels like they've been waiting for a long time. Um, and so to make sure we have, you know, some planning there to kind of reassure that community that they are on the radar. So those are kind of the three I'd like us to look at is the base bond we've sort of been talking about that's kind of a, a finishing Benson, getting our classrooms in order, getting our curriculum, dealing with some of the crises, 
adding planning for all three high schools and then building Jeff. And so the, the two year would be that first bond, adding the planning to the high schools might make it a three year and then adding Jeff might make it a four or five year. So that we'd have to also look at the timelines that would go with those dollar amounts and see what the public is willing willing to go for in, in that kind of timeline. So that's what I would like to see us hear from the public about. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Bailey, want to recap what you said earlier? Um, yeah, something like, and, and it can be, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I can, re I can remind you because I actually was going to, I was going to agree with you. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> I think I, it was 1A, 2B, and 3B, uh, to be or not to be. Um, I'm I'm kind of agnostic whether that would be one B and two A, but you know, I, I'm kind of happy with uh, either of those. So let let's say for uh, sake of argument, one A, two B, and three B. Um, but uh, here here's what I would add, um, and I want to agree about length of time, and and kind of be transparent for how this is going to work out anyway. So pretending that we had bonds were passed and we just had the money in hand and we're proceeding with rebuilding schools, we would be jump into, you know, once the 2020 bond was passed, we would be two years planning for the first school in line, which I, I hear pretty clear non-decision made consensus around Jefferson. Uh, so that after that planning period, it would be roughly um, the end of, I want to say the 22-23 school year, if I'm doing my math right, that construction would begin. Maybe I'm off a year, but, but you know, at, after that two-year planning period, construction would begin. And roughly two years after that, construction of the second high school would be we haven't talked about which one that might be. And then two years later, that third one would be. So what I think we need to do when we're talking about the difference between a 1A and a 2B, which is a couple of hundred million dollars, um, I would want to, I would want that paired with a, both the timing and rough amount of the next bond um, and some assurances from staff or not, some, some clarity from staff of can we keep with that two year, roughly two year interval, high school, high school, high school going forward. Is there A, enough money to do that and B, the timing to do that um, going forward? And again, if we did a, big bond that was, and I think we would have to go four year, we would still be queued up at the same timeline for that second high school, as I understand it. So I'd, I'd want to see a, you know, if you do a two year, you get to this point, and then the follow up bond is this, and what's the actual timing of construction for the schools? I, I think to talk about just one bond, um, is is going to? I, I think we need to to go fuller for the public to see the bigger picture going ahead. Um, so that's that's my sort of add-on request is that if we're going to do uh, whichever option, there's going to be a follow-up bond. When would that be? How would that affect uh, construction timelines, if at all? That we we need that full picture. Um, to help the public weigh in. Great, thank you. Um, I'll go next and I'll turn it over to Chair Constant to, to wrap us up. Um, yeah, I, I, I also, I think in terms of options going out to the public, would like to see 1A, 2B and 3B. And, and I think the reason for that is 1A is a, is a you know, is a very scaled back um, um, bond that, you know, it, it provides that option of sort of saying, look, let's just focus on, on you know, these, 
these immediate items um, and and sort of put the modernization on hold, with the exception of it finishes Benson, but put X modernizations on hold. I don't I don't like that option, but I think it's good to give the public and hear from them about in this environment with unemployment really high. Is that something they want to see? Um, what I like about to be um, is that it includes the planning for all three high schools and, and actually moves moves significantly forward on on the modernization while also addressing some of those things. And and then and then three B, I, I I really want to hear from the community about this Jefferson question. I do want to clarify because both options two B and three B include Jefferson moving forward, and they include Jefferson moving forward on the exact same timeline. And so I think um, as we go out to the public, we need to be really clear with them about that. Um, 2B includes funding for Jefferson to do engagement, design, construction documents, um, and would still break, you know, would still be roughly in the 2023 um, timeframe for building it. Option 3B includes all the funding for Jefferson and would still be approximately 2023 for moving forward. Um, what we lose in 3B is the opportunity to do some of that bigger, um, um, you know, conceptual thinking. What we lose in 2B, I might have confused myself on this, but what we lose in 2B is that risk of that, what if we don't go back out again? And, and to me, there's pros and cons on both sides, and, and I really want to make sure um, that we're not making this decision as a board, that we're making this decision based on, on feedback from the community. And so I, I really want to talk about what, what each of those means, specifically for Jefferson, um, and engage in that process about, about about the options that we have and the options that we that we potentially lose, um, depending on, on on what we move forward with. Um, um, Andrew, thank you yeah. for that. I want to uh, just make a comment, and that's that. Um, I did mention that I think there's a, a ton of support from Black leadership uh, and, and others. So I'm I'm hoping that you believe me when I say that, and I think we should also go out to the community because we haven't heard from anybody. And I just just a call out for everyone, like, let's listen to how we're actually talking about this so that we're not um, particularly this week when we've again, we're seeing stuff happening in the streets. People are protesting. Let's be very intentional about our language and how we're talking about things, how we're showing up for community. It's really important right now to take a trauma informed approach to this discussion. And it's really important how we land on it. And um, I just I just want us to all be a reminder for us to be mindful of how we're showing up, particularly for the black community. Um, I, I'm I'm thinking about this myself. So just let's just be mindful there. So one of the things I, I really appreciate that comment, um, Michelle. One of the things that I have learned over time uh, as as a white person with a lot of privilege is to not be the one who's making the decision, but to be the one who's asking the people impacted about the decision they want. And throughout this, this discussion tonight, I, I hope that's come through that my, my fear on option 3B is that we'll be limiting the ability of the black community to weigh in on what's gonna happen at Jefferson. Um, and so to the extent that's already happened, that's. That's that's great, and I want to hear it. But I I need to make this decision. I mean, this is something that that I want to hold myself accountable for. Um, is is making sure that I have listened authentically to the community and what they want. And so, to the extent they want funding right now, that's great. As long as we have a vision that the community agrees on. And like I said at the very beginning, if that vision exists and everyone agrees with not everyone, but a, you know a, most people agree to it, I, I am with you and I will move forward and I will fight for this for this bond and I will fight for Jefferson now. Um, but I think there are outstanding questions that I've heard from the black community that they had at least a few months ago. And, and I wanna make sure that those questions have been resolved um, moving forward. Yeah, and but I mean, a few months ago and even a week ago, I, I we're a learning institution and a learning organization literally and so I would hope that, you know, two months ago, our world was so different and we have to be able to adapt to the information as it's coming in. And, and so that's why I say like, particularly at this time right now is a time to take what we're learning, take a look around, see what's happening in our world, take that information and use that going forward. And, and I, I look forward to engaging too. And I, I appreciate your concern for the black community as a whole. Um, and I look forward to it, but I, I also want to say that we we've had new information coming in every day um, that will impact this decision greatly, not just the not just the pandemic.
Thank you. No, I appreciate that very much. And I look forward to the, to, to the conversation. Um, and I think. Andrew, that, I'm speaking of that. Can yeah. I just ask a question? Cause um, when we went over the community engagement at the, the front end, um, I'm wondering if um, now that we're done with this whole conversation and um, if we could maybe just go back to that slide of what, what that looks like, because I thought I heard like community forums, but I have had somebody um, emailing and texting me saying that it was just a survey, which you know ha obviously has its limits. And I'm wondering if we can just get a recap now at the end, what as we send off the options after we get this, we have this conversation distilled. How is the community in, engaging? And giving us their point of view before we make a final decision on the package. Great. Yeah. And maybe either Courtney or Amy yeah. can jump yeah. back in and tell us. Yeah. And, Andrew, have we heard from all board members? Oh, I'm sorry. No. Sorry. No, no, but, but I think, I think uh, Amy, uh, chair on Sam's the last one. So maybe we'll get an answer to this and then have. It, no, why don't you have anything to do with it? Sure. Well, maybe go back to Amy Ruiz to recap the um, public involvement. Um, and also, we do have, um, just back to the conversation of Jefferson, we do have, you know, a fair bit of detail in the conceptual master plan um, that Dan has linked to, which also includes information about the public engagement process there. But um, Thank you. I really appreciate everyone's comments um, coming into this conversation. Um, it's been really important to me that we keep uh, that we include planning money for Jefferson and for Cleveland and for Wilson, um, even with a contemplating a scaled down bond of roughly half the size we had been anticipating. Um, I wasn't willing to let go of the modernization of our high schools and that that promise that we've made to those school communities. And I would say particularly the Jefferson community because they have been um, deferred and put off um, pretty explicitly with the last two bonds and had a very, very reasonable expectation that it, they would Jefferson would be on this bond. So. Um, uh, in all those options, it's really important to me to keep the ball rolling on the modernization. Um, I would support um, my personal preference would probably be 3A. So that is the scaled down version with the construction, complete construction um, inclusion for Jefferson. I do still have a lot of questions about our numbers um, in particular. I think we still need to hear from our bond accountability committee. We went out of our way to change their charter so that they would have an opportunity to weigh in on the development of bond packages. And um, I know they've done that on the numbers for Benson, which is a really important figure in our considerations here. I don't believe they've had an opportunity for a deep dive into the numbers on the MPG building or um, on the Jefferson uh, conceptual master plan budget um, numbers. Um, now, the reason they haven't is because we haven't yet asked them to do that, but I think that's a really important step. Um, I also think there's some conversations that we need to have when we look more closely at the modernization budgets. Um, uh, in this case, it sounds like we're just considering one high school, but for example, we have staff recommendations that don't include the full seismic work, um, which is also something that our bond accountability uh, committee has really asked us to consider. There's a bit of an upcharge for um, the, the higher grade seismic reinforcements for the whole buildings as, as opposed to just certain um, gathering areas within the building. So I'd like to, I'd like to revisit that conversation and just really be thoughtful about the numbers that we have um, back to director Scott's point. Um, you know, we, these are the numbers that we're going to live by. And I think it's easier to put a figure out for a curriculum by and a technology by and um, you know, six roofs versus eight roofs or whatever, that's, there's more flexibility there and it's manageable. But as we all know, with these huge scale um, school modernizations, 
Um, we need to be able, we need to know that we're able to live by the budgets that we set. And I do think there's an interesting conversation in the Jefferson community about the number that we have that's come out of conceptual master planning is for the high school itself, a traditional redesign of the high school, basically on the existing footprint. Um, it doesn't contemplate any um, more creative or or broader solution that could, um, you know, bleed into some of our other school communities. For example, Tubman, or or the hu the Humboldt Building, or any of that. So, I, I'm probably fine with that, but we need to be really clear to the community that that's what that figure represents. And it does, to some extent, um, cut off our ability to to be a little bit more flexible, at least in the near term. Um, but those are some of my concerns. I'm actually um, heartened to hear the majority of our, our board colleagues um, have an appetite for going to the voters with a larger bond um, in my conversations in the last few days, um, including with um, some economists and big thinkers about where we are and where our electorate likely is. Um, I, I'm somewhat optimistic about being able to bring forward this this amount of work and this amount of scale to the community, even in this time, um, and that we are just going to keep keep renewing our commitment to rebuilding all of our skills, all of our schools on a long, long term plan. Um, so I think this is this is an exciting conversation. And that's my my personal two cents. And then I will ask Amy Ruiz if you're still on if you want to recap. Um, first of all, answer the question as to whether you feel like you've heard enough specificity from the board to narrow options that we're going to bring to the public. And then tell us can exactly what that process looks like. Or perhaps that's Courtney Wessling. Yeah, hey, um, thanks, Roseanne, for putting the slide up. So, um, yeah, we had planned to, I think, yes, this has all been very helpful to answer your question, Amy. Um, this is really helping us drive a little bit closer to uh, narrowing a path to take to the community. So, thank you all for this really rich discussion and important comments. Um, that you shared. Uh, so for community engagements moving forward, I think you know there was a slide at the beginning that showed timelines. We could go back to that really fast. Roseanne, could you go back to the top? Sorry. So here's the key dates. Um, what we're thinking right now is we're hoping to have a website live by hope early next week. I'm not going to give you a day because that will lock me into that day. Um, I've learned my lesson over time with that one. Um, so that's that's a we're going to have do, you guys are already doing a lot of great stakeholder outreach. We'll have more of that for you. Some individual one on one phone calls with um, community leaders. Many of you are talking to them now, but um, there are more. Uh, I think the other thing that we talked a lot about is a survey um, that the plan for the survey is, um, as you see on this slide, June 15th is the hope, hopeful kickoff date for a 3 week opportunity for the community to weigh in in multiple languages. It will be a mobile friendly survey. We know that folks have um, have smartphones um, if they don't have easy access um, to wireless internet at home. Um, the town hall question is a tougher one, not not anymore. I think for a while we weren't sure um, what that what a town hall would look like because we didn't know what you all were going to settle on in terms of what options you wanted to push forward. So I think with the questions around high schools um, and those high school communities being on the table, it really does make sense to do that deeper outreach with those communities. And so what we can think about in the next few days is doing that towards the end of the month, early July, um, to lead into that next couple weeks after the third, um, and then have a public hearing on the 21st. So that is where we are right now. Um, we definitely have heard you taking copious notes and we'll welcome um, any additional feedback you have for us. All right, thank you so much. Uh, um, Director Constam. Yes, uh, Director Bailey. Can I just say uh, thank you for uh, reminding us about the, the seismic roof work for our most vulnerable schools. Um, and uh, I, I will, if that's not part of uh, 
these options, I would like to see that put on the table somewhere. Uh, it, it, it is amusing to me as the guy who started out at 1.4 billion and everybody said, no, 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 no. Uh, let's go small that uh, we've, uh, we've crept at least back up to a billion. So there you go. It's your gentle persuasion. <laughs> yeah. And I also wanted to just mention that my, when I mentioned a hybrid approach, I, in my mind, um, was talking about those um, infrastructure improvements such as the roofs and I think the seismic is um, you have to do seismic when you do a roof and there's a code requirement you have to meet there, but um, it my hybrid approach would include some infrastructure work as well. Chair Constant, um, Courtney, again, I forgot to mention one other engagement um, option for folks. We do have an email address. It's schoolbond at pps.net and that is working and we're checking it. So please, if folks have um, comments that they'd like to send in via email. It's schoolbond at pps.net. Thank you. Um, thank you, Director Scott, for your help tonight in facilitating this and in managing it through the um, school improvement bond committee process. Um, if seeing if that there's nothing else for the good of the order, going once, going twice. This work session of the Board of Education of Portland Public Schools is now adjourned. Thanks everybody for your time. Great feedback. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.